Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. I was about 21 or 22 when this happened. I was in the military at Fort Sill and didn't know it, but Desert Storm was right around the corner. At the time, I lived in south central Oklahoma on the outskirts of a small town called Duncan. I was helping a friend ground up some cattle that got out because someone had run across a T-section and went through their fence. It tore two posts down and left a 30-foot section open for the cattles to get out. We'd already found most of the cattle and we were missing another three or four, so we were out at 1am on dirt bikes trying to find them before someone hit one of them and sued his father. My friend and I went east and the other guys went north and south. One thing you need to understand about Oklahoma is that most of it is farmed, either cattle or crops. It is also divided into one mile sections for the most part. In other words, the roads all run north and south or east and west and intersect at one mile intervals. If you ask directions for something out in the country, you are more likely than not to get instructions that include go three mile sections north and then two mile sections west. The area at this time was sparse and there weren't many homes. We didn't know how long the hole had been in the fence. My friend's father only checked the fence because he was missing livestock. They owned the entire mile section and a good portion of the adjoining mile section. The hole in the fence was on the east side of their land, at the furthest distance from their house. They checked the fence for such holes on a weekly basis, so the hole could not have been more than two days old. James and I were riding on these old dusty, dirt roads with battery-powered spotlights to both show the way and to search for cattle. We'd stop at any of the million small wooden bridges and look to see if there were any cows down by the water. Our plan was to go out 10 miles and then go over a mile section and drive back 10 miles until we'd gone a total of 10 miles out and 10 miles over. Then we would do it all over again but on the north and south roads instead of the east and west roads. If you were to plot it a map, it would be a 10 by 10 grid. We had been at it since before 9pm, just as it was getting dark and we'd already gone 10 miles out and about 3 miles over. I need to mention at this point that there are some mile sections that are not divided by roads and you have to turn one way or another at a T intersection. If that happens, we always took the road that went in our general direction of travel. If we were traveling east and came to a T, and we'd already checked the road north of us, then we head to the south a mile and then head east again. Occasionally, an old farmer would pass away and leave his land to relatives who had no interest in farming, and the land would be up for sale or just left alone for years. When this happens, and the roads aren't used as much, Nature reclaims them and you're usually left with a dirt road with weeds and grass growing on it or you're left with little more than an improved trail, usually two ruts with overgrown weeds and Johnson grass and occasionally a tree. We were on one of those rutted roads, headed south to the next intersection where we turned east again. The land here was too hilly for cultivation and had been left alone for at least the last 30 years. We were both familiar with it and we hunted and fished there. This mile section and the next two were basically wild. At the end of the dirt trail would be a T intersection, but the west side was fenced and the only option was to turn east again. At the end of this mile section, the road was a dead end, but we had to check it and the double back. We just made the turn back to the east when we saw something burning over the next rise. Grass fires are extremely dangerous and can get out of control in minutes. As we topped the rise, we saw the fire was actually in the middle of the dirt road. When we got to it, we found that it was a recliner that was burning. A blue lazy boy recliner. We stopped and threw some dirt on it and finally got it extinguished. James and I were wondering what kind of an idiot would do this and how strange it was to be in the middle of the road just burning. Satisfied that the fire was out, we got back on our bikes and idled past the recliner toward the end of the mile section, still a quarter of a mile in the distance. We found one of their cows at the bottom of the rise, about a hundred feet down the road. It was laying in half in and half out of the road. Its throat had been cut and it was laying there with its eyes open and tongue hanging out. There was blood everywhere. As we were looking at it and trying to figure out what happened, James said, hey, look at this. It showed me where the blood had dripped from the cow to about 10 feet away from it. There were shoe prints of blood in the road. It was just part of a shoe print, but you could tell that was a shoe print. We found two more when we looked more diligently. At this point, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up and it was suddenly a very cool evening. I looked at James and his eyes were as big as saucers. He thought something spooky was happening too. We talked about going back, but we knew that we'd be shamed if we didn't see if there was anything else. We finally decided to walk the bikes the rest of the way to the dead end just in case there was someone there. We didn't want them to hear the engines. We began walking the last quarter mile or so to the dead end. It was at the base of the last hill and we just started heading up onto the other side. My heart was going at about 200 miles per hour and I had cotton mouth so bad that it was almost impossible to swallow. 
Then I noticed that someone had stuck paper plates of the barbs of the wire on the fence. We looked and there were plates stuck to the top strand of a wire on both sides of the road. It started about 50 feet behind us, it continued up and over the hill. They were evenly spaced about 5 feet apart. As our gaze followed the row of paper plates up the top of the hill, James suddenly said, There's another fire, and it was at that moment that I could smell it. But what I smelled wasn't that normal smoky smell. It was as though someone had added incense into it. I asked James if he could smell that and he could. I told him that I didn't like this at all. I was okay with losing face in front of our friends and his dad and brothers. I was ready to go. He agreed with me but said that we had to see what was burning. We were both whispering and we were both shaking so much that our voices quivered. We started up the hill again and I was thinking with every step that we were going to be seriously killed or worse. As we got to the top of the hill, one of the paper plates blew off the fence and skittered behind us making both of us jump and it was all I could do to not scream. After I saw what it was, I started to laugh it off, but James shushed me and told me to listen. We could hear voices. As we topped the hill and were able to see the bottom where the road stopped, we saw a group of about 10 people all standing around another recliner that was burning. They had their backs to us and they were passing a big picture around. From our vantage point, we couldn't actually see what was in the picture, but the slit throat of the cow haunted my thoughts. They would each take a mouthful and spit it into the fire. This went on until the picture was empty. The entire time, they were all saying something in unison. We could only understand an occasional word. They changed their tones in a rhythmic manner with an emphasis in the last word. I can remember hearing here and there and beseech and father. James and I stood there on top of the hill like a couple of idiots. Our mouths hanging wide open and actually scared stiff. After a minute or two, they would repeat whatever it was, all the while passing around that pitcher and spitting it into the fire. There was a small camp table set up on the side and a little behind them. After the last of the liquid was gone, a man turned and sat the pitcher on the table and picked up what looked like a large loaf of bread. Just as he was turning back to the fire, he evidently saw us. I am sure that we made a nice silhouette sitting there at the top of the hill. He screamed hey and dropped the loaf of bread and started running in our direction. The others turned and immediately followed him. That was all the encouragement that we needed. It was time to go. We turned up our bikes around. James got his started on the first kick, but I somehow managed to get myself off balance and when I kicked, the bike fell on its side with me. By this time I was near panic and was breathing in raspy short breaths. I picked the bike up again and tried to start it, but it didn't start. I thought about running, but we were out in the middle of nowhere. I finally started pushing the motorcycle down the other side of the hill and jumped on it. It seemed like it took forever to get enough speed, but I popped the clutch and it started. James was waiting at the corner of the intersection to make sure that I was coming and we were headed for his house, going way too fast for safety, especially in the dark. When we finally got back to his house, we told his dad what we'd seen. His dad called a couple of friends and they all loaded up in their trucks with enough weapons to start a small war. James and I sat with his dad and told him where to turn. His dad kept asking us questions on the way. What were they doing? Why was there a chair on fire? They cut the cow's throat? How many were there? What did they look like? What were they driving? The last question stumped us. We hadn't seen any cars or trucks. The road was the only way in or out and there was a creek that ran on the back side of the end of that particular road so they couldn't have gone that direction. How did they get there with two recliners? When we got to that last stretch of road, the headlights found the spot where the recliner had been sitting. It was gone. We could all see where the road and surrounding grass was burned, but the recliner was not there. As we got closer, James noticed that the cow was gone too. I hate to admit, but I was getting scared all over again. I was afraid that his dad would tell us that it was our imagination and not believe us. When we got closer to the burnt spot in the road, Buster, James' dad, noticed the chair off in the ditch on the left side of the road. Then I noticed the cow on the other side. It was also in the ditch. The paper plates were all gone. Buster got out to look at the cow with the other men. They stood there talking and shaking their heads for what seemed like 10 minutes before getting back into the trucks. We continued toward the hill. The ruts made by spinning motorcycle tires were easily seen, but there was no fire on the other side of the hill. We all went down to where the other recliner had been burning, but it and the camp table were gone. You could see where someone had walked around the charred area and covered it with dirt. After we left, James saw a paper plate about 50 feet on the other side of the fence. Buster called the county sheriff when we got home, and by that time it was daylight and we went out again with the sheriff and a deputy. When we got back to the road, the first recliner and the cow were gone but you could still see where something had been on fire and there was still blood on the road and in the grass. James showed them the shoe prints we'd seen. At the bottom of the hill, you could still see the charred area where the second recliner had been burning and the deputy found the little scuff marks where the table had been sitting. At the end of the road, you could see where the top strand of the fence had been tugged down and wrapped around the lower strand so someone could crawl over it. You could also see where the grass and weeds had been trampled, providing a fairly easy trail to follow. 
we found a woman's tennis shoe on the other side of the creek. You could see where someone had climbed up the bank on the far side of the creek. We followed the trail all the way across the field up to the next dirt road. Again, the top wire was wrapped around the next lower wire and there was a piece of red bandana looking material caught in it. There were marks on the road where two or three different cars had spun their tires when they left. Buster also found a large piece of glass that had blood on it. Buster filed a report for the missing cow. They'd found four more cows in the opposite direction from where me and James had gone. They never found the recliners or the missing cow. The sheriff called a few days later and told Buster that the blood on the glass was human and not bovine. It was his guess that the pitcher broke and someone cut their hand while carrying it back to their vehicles. Two weeks after that, there was a huge scare in our community about some cult that had promised the area at large that they were going to kidnap someone and sacrifice them. Buster always said that it was just someone running their mouth after hearing about our incident. It was all anyone talked about that summer. Buster also said that he sure would like to know what happened to that cow. The story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking, particularly in areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking the edges of exposed cliffs, beating cougar and bear territory, knowing that I was very far away from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007, and I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the last and national forest in northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock dressed in nearly all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long unkept beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandoned personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and simply watched me as I passed. Even that I didn't find odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree approximately 5 feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed the food wasn't there. I immediately thought a bear had entered my campsite and so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite, two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up to the rope from which the food was hanging. I thought of the couple I had passed earlier and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured the couple was simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than food. Several days passed and my mind was at ease again. I had begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of an intruder, animal or otherwise. I awoke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is much more likely an animal than a person. Then I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark, surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to be silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent and was ready to slash at whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lied frozen awake in my tent until sunrise and opened my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence something had actually happened were the boot prints, the same as before. Several more days passed and I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 70 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail, being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line. I could see the trail winding for miles in front of me and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade and noticed two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, screw this, this trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Castella located off I-5. The only problem was that it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent and tried to sleep, but every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sounds travel far in the absence of other sound. I knew they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is screwed up. This is so screwed up. Finally, a flashlight hits my tent. 
lights up the entire thing, and goes dark. I unzipped my tent and climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. Then I heard footsteps running towards the tent and barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately 5 minutes I tripped, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and laid still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours. I was certain they were gone but I didn't move. Eventually, birds started chirping and I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail, abandoned my campsite, and walked the rest of the distance to Castella where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta and spoke with the police and forest service. They put me in a motel for the night and my parents drove from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later who told me there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there have been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experienced. As far as I know, nothing ever came of the couple. This happened in the fall of 1993, when I was 20 years old. In the interest of context, this was before I started college, and I was working in the material prep department of a plastics factory on the night shift. I was the only woman in the department, and my male co-workers were initially skeptical that I could handle the job, but I proved myself and earned their respect. It was hard work, but on the plus side, it also put me in the best shape of my life. I had just gotten off work, and it was about 1.30am. My car was running on fumes, so I stopped at a local gas station to fill up. While I was pumping gas, a woman about my age approached me looking nervous and scared. She said that she had been at her boyfriend's house, and they had a fight. She'd walk up to the gas station to use the payphone and call her to pick her up. On her way to the station, our car pulled up as she was walking and the guys inside started catcalling and harassing her. With a slight moving of her head, she indicated a car that was parked off to the side by the gas station dumpsters. I saw a large light green car, like a caddy or a Lincoln, with at least two or three shadowy figures inside. She said they threatened her and she was too scared to call her friend and wait. The woman was neat, well dressed, and didn't seem high or drunk or anything like that. She just seemed really nervous and freaked out, so I didn't even hesitate. I finished pumping my gas and told her to hop in the car, then I'd take her home. At that time on a weeknight, there was little traffic, so I booked it right out of the gas station and asked her where she lived. She kept twisting around in the seat to see if the car was behind us, and when I asked her to put her seatbelt on, she ignored me and kept looking for the car. I assumed she was just scared. A few blocks down the road, however, I noticed she was looking around the car, and she started asking me about the money. Where's your purse? Where's your bag? I need money. You need to give me some money. My stomach sank. I have this woman in my car, and now she's gonna rob me. But when I thought about it, robbery just didn't make much sense. I was driving a 1985 Chevette and was wearing my work clothes, a ratty t-shirt and jeans with combat boots. I did not look like a person with a lot of cash, primarily because I wasn't a person with a lot of cash. She twisted around in the seat again and started yelling, there they are, there they are. She didn't sound scared anymore. I checked the rear view and sure enough, the light green car is right behind me. She started cackling and bouncing up and down in the seat. My boys are gonna screw you up, they're gonna screw you up. She's laughing like crazy, opening the glove box looking in the back for a bag or purse, telling me all the messed up things these guys are planning to do to me. Now, if I had been smart, I would have just driven to the police station. Actually, if I had been very smart, I would have just called the cops from the gas station and waited with her until they arrived. That would have been the intelligent thing to do. Unfortunately, none of this crossed my mind until later. In the moment, I just got really, really angry. I realized three key things all at once. There was an intersection up ahead, with cars on either side waiting to cross, and the light had just turned yellow. I had a spare box cutter that I kept for work in the driver's side door compartment. The lady still had it put on her seatbelt. I didn't think. I floored it and passed under the yellow light just as it turned red. I glanced back to see if the green car was still behind me, but the cross traffic at the intersection had started to move, and they had it caught up. The woman started yelling. I slammed on the brakes and she hit the dash and windshield with a solid and viciously satisfying crack. When she rebounded to the passenger seat, I had the box cutter in her face and was screaming some serious stuff. I can't remember exactly what I said but it was along the lines of, get out, get out of my car before I cut off your face and make you eat it. The crazy screaming and box cutter combo worked. She grabbed blindly at the handle and popped the door open, and I started shoving and punching her until she tumbled out the door to the curb. I stomped on the gas, got to the next turn, and squealed around it with the passenger door still open. I made a few more turns because I was afraid that the green car might catch up to me. After a little while, I stopped to close the passenger door, and then I cut across town and got onto the highway to go home. I was on the highway for about 5 minutes before the shake started. I pulled off to the shoulder to calm down and get my act together, and then I drove home. I told my older sister. I was living with her temporarily after the breakup with my ex. She grabbed me in a tight bear hug while simultaneously yelling about how stupid I was for not going to the police. I've never been so glad to be yelled at in my life. 
I've lived most of my life way out in the valley countryside of Ontario. Given, it's not a whole lot for an 18 year old, but for me it's the only place I can call home. And I like to think that I know the entire area, as far as sprawling that is, like the back of my hand. Adventures across the long, cross-crossing roads, pastures, and woods that made up the skeleton of my village were a common venture in my childhood. As a young kid, I had a habit of biking extremely far out in hopes of finding new places, and sometimes, my dad or one of my friend's parents would toss out bikes in their pickup and take us way out into a back road and let us explore for a few hours. This was how a lot of us first found that on one of these bad gravel roads surrounded by thin woods was a worn down old shack sitting just about 20 meters off of the path. Honestly, I never thought anything of it, except for the fact that it was creepy. It had no windows to see inside, and I never went anywhere near it. But one of my friends at the time said that her older sister had tried to go in it and that the door was always locked. We all had better things to do than to be curious about that at the time anyway. So I quickly moved on and became nothing more than a mundane landmark of that area. Honestly, I had completely forgotten about it for a few years now. Except last Tuesday. I was coming home from one of my very late classes at my university, and I usually take the back routes I used many years ago, as they're more straightforward and never have any sort of traffic. As I drove down the gravel path that would wind along the side of the country and eventually take me to the next street I needed to turn onto, I noticed a faint glinting coming from within the trees up ahead, maybe about 100 meters from my car. A flashlight? I thought, but as my car came closer, I realized what I was really seeing. The light inside of the shack was on. I should mention now that in all of the nearly 13 years I've spent living in my area, I have never seen that door open, and I've never seen a light on inside of that shack, ever. Not even once. I must have driven past that shack probably almost a hundred times in my life, but this was the first time I'd ever seen any sign of a person's presence having been anywhere near that thing. That, coupled with the fact that it was 10 o'clock at night and pitch black outside aside from my own headlights, and the faint glow lighting up the door frame up ahead immediately filled me with what I can only describe as a weird sense of dread. Fortunately, while my car approached the light, I was curious enough that despite the feeling in my stomach, I slowed down as I was about to pass, hoping that I could see what was going on inside, and this is probably the only reason I managed to spot the dark shape that burst out of the foliage on the side of the road, directly into my path. I wasn't going very fast at that point, but I still pounded the brakes rather hard in alarm, so my car came to a crunching stop on the gravel. For a moment, I was just really confused and freaked out. What was that? Had I almost hit a deer or something? This far out in the country, a deer would have been the most likely and most reasonable assumption. But in the beams of my car, I could see what had stopped me. A very tall, a very lanky old man with scraggly and balding gray hair. He looked dirty and unkempt, and as his clothes hung off of him, I felt extremely unsettled over what this guy could be doing way out here, and why he had walked out in front of my car. As I sat there confused, the old man came around to my window and knocked on the glass. I rolled down the window just a crack, only enough for someone to be able to hear me and for me to hear them. I was already creeped out enough as it was. Immediately, I had to say what I was thinking. What are you doing out here? In my peripheral vision, I could still see the light from the shack, but in my mind's eye, I wasn't really registering it anymore. Stupid, I know. I should have made the connection immediately, but I was still kind of shaken by the fact that I could have run this guy over if I hadn't been able to stop in time. And being a new driver and all, the thought of that was terrifying. After a small pause, the man started talking to me. He had a thick, croaky sort of voice and he spoke very slowly. My truck, it's broken, he explained. Oh, okay. I was also getting the feeling that he wasn't really all there, mentally. I didn't have to look around to notice there wasn't any truck on the side of the road, but I did anyway, turning my head around to confirm what I already knew. There was definitely no truck. Had he somehow driven it into the trees or something? As far as I can remember and see, there wasn't enough space anywhere in them for a truck to fit through. What was the man talking about? While I was looking, it was honestly as though I could feel that he was watching me, and when I turned back, he was still leaning down to peer inside of my window at me. Where? I don't see it. I was definitely distrustful of this guy already. At first, he didn't respond, and my nerves were only getting worse the longer we were alone out here. Then he replied, It's just up the road, he said, turning just to point with his finger in that general direction. The lights on my car aren't exactly the greatest, but I could still see far enough that I really couldn't imagine where on earth this truck was supposed to be. I couldn't spot the faintest sight of it. While I squinted up ahead, he continued, I'll show you where, if you come. At this point, I really had no idea what this old man was thinking I could do to help. I'm just an 18 year old girl. I don't exactly look like the type of person who knows a lot about cars or how to fix them. 
for the record, I'm really not, but I was tired from a long day at school so I absolutely was not at my brightest. And for some reason, a part of me felt guilty about leaving him out here alone if his truck really was broken. Okay, I said, and I reached to my gear shift to start driving slowly up the road, but as soon as he saw my hand, he shook his head. Just walk, it's not too far. What? Excuse me, but no thanks. How was I going to see anything in the dark if I got out of my car and followed him anyway? There was no harm in driving wherever he was trying to lead me. The more I talked to the guy, the more unnerved I was getting, and the more red flags were starting to pop up in my mind. I couldn't see a car anywhere, and this total stranger wanted me to get out of mine and follow him into the dark on this creepy road in the middle of nowhere. Uh, no. I'd rather drive to it, I responded. I could see his brow furrow, and he looked kind of agitated. He insisted, your car won't fit in the trees anyway. So did his truck crash then? Why the trees, if we were going up the road? I remembered what I'd just been thinking a minute earlier about there not being enough space, and I asked him, then how did yours get in the trees? The only logical explanation would have been that his truck had swerved off the road, but even if that were the case, there was seriously nothing at all that I could have done to help him fix his car or get it back out again. The entire situation was beginning to make me very scared. There was a lengthy enough pause between my question and him speaking up that I was beginning to think that he didn't hear me or something. So I asked again, still no immediate answer. When he finally did reply, he was staring at me directly in the eyes. You really don't look old enough to drive. I hear comments like this a lot, since I do look very young because of my size. Normally, somebody would say this with a smile or something to signify that this is, in fact, meant to be taken as a joke. But this guy's face didn't change even slightly. He just kept staring at me with a completely cold expression. That type of a remark in this kind of situation immediately had my heart racing. And all I could think was, what did this guy want from me? What I wanted to say next was, well, who are you? But instead, I anxiously fumbled for my phone in my pocket, babbling in a way that probably made it really obvious that I was completely freaked out of my mind. Uh, okay, I could just call someone to come help you out. There's not really anything I can do. As I said that it occurred to me to wonder, did this old guy not have a cell phone of his own? I know not every older person has one, even if they're becoming much more common, but seriously. And then I also remembered, with a sudden streak of massive fear, the shack with the light on. I could still see the light coming from it just up ahead in the trees. My dumb brain finally put two and two together. The old man hadn't even mentioned it at all. It was like it wasn't even there to him, and there was definitely no one out there that could have turned the light on but the guy who was just standing outside my car right now. What was he doing out here in the shack then, which had been locked for all these years by someone I never knew? There was definitely no truck around here. He wanted me out of my car for a whole nother reason. I think maybe the old man must have seen on my face that I was scared out of my wits and about to book it out of there. Instead of any words, without warning, his face contorted with rage, and he swung his fist, pounding against it my window with enough strength to make it shudder. His eyes were wide and he looked furious and completely insane. Even though I was panicking more than I ever had in my life, and I was sure he was about to smash the window in if he tried again, I screamed, threw my phone onto the floor, switched gears, and slammed my foot down on the gas pedal. I hurtled down the road, and when I glanced into my rearview mirror, I saw his dark shape turn from standing in the road, and I watched as he turned and he walked off the road, directly back towards the light of the shack. I didn't slow down at all until I was nearly home, and absolutely sure that there was no way that he could have followed me. When I got home that night, I spent a long time crying about what had happened with my mom, and though I don't think she believed all of what I told her, we don't have the greatest relationship, she called up everyone she knew to ask if anyone knew the old man, or if they knew who owned that shack. In a town like ours, just about everyone knows each other, but no one had any clue who he was. One of our family friends even swore that he was sure it's been abandoned for at least four years now. And since most people don't usually take that road, no one said that they've ever seen a light on or the door open but me. I've been taking a different route home from school since, and I really don't think I ever want to head back down that road. Creepy guy in the shack, please, let's not meet again. This happened when I was in college. I lived in Isla Vista, the student community at UCSB. Notorious for being a party school, it fully lived up to its reputation. I liked to party, but wow, these people were off the wall. As such, there were a lot of people who put themselves in dangerous situations. Drinking to excess, not being careful, not locking doors, etc. It had a very isolated and insular vibe, and anyone who was hanging around who wasn't college-aged immediately looked at a place and strange. One night after having a few drinks, I came home to my small house where I lived with two other girls probably around 2.30 a.m. We were all serious students, I was probably the least serious actually, and we partied and it was not your typical UCSB mega rager. 
more like a small get together with friends. We would often have a few people spend the night, sleep in our furniture, or in our beds as this case may be. That night my roommates had a few people over who I didn't know, and I saw when I returned home that one of them had opted to sleep on the couch from the shadow that I saw there. I didn't turn the light on so I wouldn't wake anyone up, but as I was passing the couch to enter my bedroom, I noticed that the figure was lying very stiff. He just had this weird energy to him. He was lying down, but it was like he was putting all of his energy into lying as still and rigid as possible. I paused, and the guy quickly jerked his head to face me, without moving his limbs. So quickly that it startled me. I could see his wide open eyes glinting in the dark. Figuring that I'd startled him, or that he was drunk, or maybe on some kind of stimulant and unable to sleep, I just hurried past into my bedroom and locked the door. The dude made me so nervous, and I wasn't taking any chances. I fell asleep. At 4.30am, I woke up. There was a strange sound at the door, almost like somebody was drumming their fingers against the wood very quietly. I lay still and listened. There were more quiet sounds like someone scratching the door with their fingers, which got louder and louder until it was clear that he was using both hands and scratching as fast and as hard as possible. It created an extremely loud and intimidating sound that filled me with fear. I got my cell phone and texted my roommate because I was afraid to make a sound. Your friend is freaking me out. Is he coked out? Can you talk to him? He's banging and scratching on my door. She didn't text me back, probably because she was asleep. I texted my other roommate to the same effect, covering all of my bases. Keep in mind that the scratching has been going on at this point for a couple minutes. I have no idea how he could have sustained it. Scratching a wooden door with your fingernails can't feel good. He also grabbed at the knob and jiggled it super forcefully. Because neither of them answered, I decided to call and really wake them up, though I was scared to make a sound. I know it sounds stupid, but there was something seriously horrifying about being teased like this through the door. I knew that he was trying to terrify me. I felt like a little kid, but I could tell this guy was screwed up or something and maybe the police needed to be called, and I wanted to loot my roommates in since it was one of their friends. The scratching stopped abruptly, and I called my roommate, who answered sleepily. Yo, your friend is messed up, can you please deal with it? Do we need to call the cops? He's seriously scaring me and he was scratching at my bedroom door. He's really weird. She didn't say anything for several seconds, and when she did speak, her voice had no sleepiness in it at all. What friend, she said. That guy that was sleeping on the couch, I said. She was quiet again. We didn't have any guys over, she said. Call the police. My adrenaline surged and I told her to please lock the bedroom door as quickly as possible. I realized that I hadn't heard scratching in a while and I had no clue where the dude had gone. Suddenly, I heard a loud banging in the other end of the house, where my roommates, Lauren and Monica, shared a bedroom. The bangs were followed by the sound of them screaming in fear. I quickly dialed the police as this maniac proceeded to bang against the, luckily, locked bedroom door of my two roommates as they screamed. The heaviness of the blows left no doubt that he was trying to break the door down. I told the 911 operator the situation and she dispatched two squad cars. The police in Isla Vista are generally used to peeling drunks off the sidewalk and breaking up brawls. This was really serious and strange and I think the dispatcher got the sense from my tone how terrified I was. She stayed on the phone with me. At one point the banging stopped and everything was quiet for a while. I talked with the dispatcher and suddenly looked down to see that this guy had slipped his fingers through the one inch gap between my door and the floor was just kind of waggling them around, making this weird growling sound. I screamed and backed away, which is my biggest regret about the situation. Since when I look back at it, it would have been so awesome to just stomp his fingers and hear the guy howl in pain. When the cops rolled up, I heard running and the sound of our sliding glass door opening and closing, and then he was gone. The cops never caught him. He had broken in through our side door by jimmying the lock somehow. My door was covered in what turned out to be huge gashes he'd made using a pair of scissors, which he discarded on the ground before he left. What terrifies me the most about this was that I walked right past him. I looked him right in the face. I realized now that he was not trying to sleep or on drugs, but was lying so stiff like that because he was hiding. He probably heard me open the door and freaked out because he hadn't realized there was another girl living there and tried to blend into the couch in the darkness. The story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a USAF Security Forces Airman, military police. My girlfriend was at work, and as a sweltering hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on, and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. 
We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange. It was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would not have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread, and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested I call out, I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area, but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it, all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp, should we need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. Let's go, let's get out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way we had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I called the state police, and they promised to send a trooper out to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing were all gone, though he could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area, and do not intend to. Okay, so I've had a few issues with my next door neighbor since I moved in, but nothing creepy until just recently. There was a man, a woman, and at least one boy living there, and I mostly just avoid them. The man seems okay but a bit weird, and the boy just keeps to himself, and the woman is quite a bit off. Not long after we moved in, she left a note in my mailbox. Our mailboxes are right beside each other, between our houses. Anyway, I stood at the mailbox reading the note. She thought that my dog was using the bathroom in her yard. It was possible, as our friends had some holes in it, that our dog had gotten out then, but those holes had been fixed a long time ago. Still, no big deal, except I noticed her standing in her driveway, just staring at me, and the note was very long. I just kept reading it. The more I read it, the crazier it got, and the weirder her behavior in my peripheral vision became. Apparently I was entitled. She seemed to think I was somehow instructing my dog to use the bathroom in the yard. Her note went on a tangent about how awful dogs are, she was also 100% convinced it was my dog, even though there are always tons of loose dogs, cats, and wildlife wandering around and no doubt traveling through her unfenced backyard. In my peripheral vision, she got into her SUV, backed out of her driveway, then parked it along the street directly behind me and just idled there, staring. The note then went on a weird, long tirade about the previous family to live in my house, saying I was Anther Deb as if I'd have any idea at all what that is even supposed to mean. Then concluded in some odd insults and some implied not quite threats. This is the closest thing we ever had to a conversation at this point. I can understand not wanting a dog using the bathroom in her yard, but this was a bit of an extreme reaction as this was literally the first time I'd even heard of there being a problem. 
A simple note would have done, but this note was insane. She was still staring behind me. I decided to try to ignore her and just go to my house. That's when she shouted out her window, Are you playing a game? The reaction made no sense. Are you nuts? I replied, as I officially ran out of patience. She shouted more nonsense and insults at me while blocking my driveway, which was right next to the mailboxes with her vehicle, while I repeatedly told her to leave before I called the cops. This went back and forth like this for a while, but she eventually sped off when I pulled my cell phone out. Later, my boyfriend, who had not been home at this time this happened, had a chat with the neighbors. He said they seemed agreeable and reasonable and basically dismissed me of just being dramatic. The woman told a very different version of events, of course. I was annoyed that my boyfriend wasn't taking me seriously, but let it go. I think he just wanted to keep getting along with the man next door, as they sometimes borrow tools. They speak to him a lot differently than how they speak to me. They don't do anything rude to me while he's around. In fact, they don't speak to me when he's around at all. They always wait for him to be away. Anyway, I mostly just avoid them. Sometimes, the woman stares at me, but I just ignore her. Until recently, I have been mostly successful. Here's the creepy story. I don't sleep well at night when I'm home alone, and I'm always home alone now because my boyfriend is out of the country on business for months at a time. I often feel like there's someone just outside my house or at my door. Sometimes, my dogs act up at odd hours, but I never see anyone. I keep my house alarm armed and my pistol in my nightstand. The other night was one such night. I didn't sleep well and kept having a sinking feeling that something was wrong. Anyway, I got out of bed at about 2am because I thought I was scheduled to work at 3am. I had mostly given up on getting a restful sleep then anyway. As I left my house, I heard something to my left, the direction of my neighbor's house, but didn't see anything. I was always nervous in my driveway because the motion sensor light was broken, but there was always a lot of darkness between my door and my truck, so I always moved quickly to my driveway. I got in my truck and went to work. It turned out that I misread my schedule and didn't work at 3 that morning after all. Annoyed at the mistake, but grateful I'd get to go home and sleep a little more before the actual start of my shift at 7, I went home. I pulled into my driveway and didn't see anything in the beam of my truck's headlights. I always look around my truck before getting out. I turned the headlight off and got out. I took a few steps ahead of my truck, and then all of a sudden a large man called out to me, shouted really, from the shadows at the corner of my house. He scared me so bad that I screamed, reached for my pepper spray, and fell down. Not useful. He apologized in a tone that didn't sound sorry at all. It was my neighbor, and that wasn't much of a relief. Apparently it was my fault that he occasionally found trash in his yard, in Windy, Colorado. Complaining about this seemed to be a lot more important issue than scaring the heck out of me while I'm alone at night. He showed no real concern or realization that was even wrong at all. Again, I have no problem with neighbors bringing issues to my attention, but seriously, hey, can you make sure trash from your bins isn't blown into my yard is not a question that takes 10 minutes nor is it one that needs to be addressed at 3 in the morning. I'm not in agreement to keep the peace, but I know the trash isn't mine. We live in a windy area. Trash gets blown around in people's yards all the time. No big deal. But he would just not stop going on about it. He kept needlessly repeating himself and made some not quite but kind of threat about getting along. Think about the lines of, it would be a shame if something were to happen, type sort of threats. He was keeping me busy. I didn't even notice his wife flank me. Before I even knew she was there, she appeared from the shadows by a tree. She wanted to yell at me about some eggs. A few weeks ago, I found a bunch of eggs smashed on the road near our shelled mailbox. As the carton was right next to them, I thought the carton had obviously just been dropped. Not that someone was trying to egg anything. I assumed my neighbor had dropped the eggs on her way to get the mail and just left them. She denies this, but I still think that's the most likely explanation because no one else has any reason to be out at our mailbox with eggs. But I didn't care enough to say anything to her about it at the time, so I just let it go and forgot all about it. Now she was accusing me of leaving eggs around, again, inexplicably expressing the grievance at 3am. Weird that she hadn't brought it up weeks ago when it happened, but I know why she didn't. My boyfriend was still here then. My boyfriend has been away on business for several weeks now, long enough for them to have noticed his absence. They were also probably aware that my motion sensor light was out. They sure seemed to know how to avoid my headlight beams. Being surprisingly patient, I explained that I knew nothing about the eggs. I mentioned that I later found a lot of the shells in my yard and figured a squirrel must have carried them there. She proudly informed me that she tossed them onto my yard herself. Apparently she thought that was okay, but someone dropping them in the first place isn't. Anyway, this is where I started to get over my shock a bit and started getting pissed. Initially, I had been somewhat relieved that the man in the shadows had been my neighbor, not some random crazy person, but now I was pissed. I had now been outside with them for like 20 minutes, while they accused me about stupid stuff. 
Well, I tried to be polite and agreeable even though I had nothing to do with it, but now everything wrong with the situation had just kicked in. I eventually remembered that I don't actually have to put up with any of this and cut her off mid-rant and said, It's 3am, I'm going home, Good night," and turned on my heel. I heard her say something in an unkind tone as I left, but didn't catch what it was. They had staked out my house, waited for my boyfriend to leave, and long enough to be sure he was gone, all to complain about some insane stuff long after it supposedly even happened. If they have concerns, surely there are better times to address them than at 3am. What were they doing out at 3am anyway? And that man had totally purposely hidden a shed at the corner of my house where he could avoid my headlights didn't reveal himself until I was out of my truck and exposed. And shouldn't the woman have walked up beside her husband, not gone around while I was distracted? They kept doing odd behavior, never enough that they're doing anything illegal or anything to report the police, but none of this is normal behavior. Honestly, I think these complaints are just excuses and they're really just taking the opportunity to intimidate me. I think they're messing with me on purpose. Then again, I could be wrong. Either way, I will be installing a motion light soon. I was so shaken up and had my adrenaline so high from someone scaring me from a blind spot by my house. Because seriously, that could have been someone else and a whole lot worse. The story starts several years ago. Me and my friend's interest in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which was when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom, so we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. Now, keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and were especially drawn if there was an element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips, but we made sure that if we were going into any old building in the dark, we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. We never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't yet snow on the ground, but it was actually a chilly evening. Directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around from the TB area, is a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I can only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. We had been inside the hospital a few times, but never found anything strange, only the occasional sign of others having been or lived there. What was piquing our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to the hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead had to hop over a tall wall and climb a very high fence. A few of us had backpacks, containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a couple bottles of water, so nothing too heavy or valuable that would get damaged when tossed over the obstacles before us. A little ways off the road, it was dark if you clung to the buildings. We did for a while before stepping behind a small patch of shrubbery, which we determined was an easy way over the first wall since the other way around to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in that corner behind the bushes, no one could see us from the street. I don't believe I went first, but I did not remain behind to be last over that wall. It was too high up for me to jump and haul myself over so I resorted to stepping on a pipe jutting out somewhere lower along the wall. It gave me a bit of a needed boost, and soon I was up and over, moving into the library's courtyard. Another girl and I waited for our two other girlfriends to join us. Upon an initial glance over at the courtyard, there was no obvious way in. To our right was a dilapidated fountain, which I took joy in imagining spring forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months people laughing and talking with the surrounding trees bringing them shade. Now, however, it had been in long disuse, and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for years, save the 15 chain link fence directly in front of us separating the courtyard in half. I could tell it hadn't seen the same weather as the rest of the courtyard, because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with a fence like that, someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground rather silently due to their lightness. I was the third over, because I have a slight fear of climbing and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, then sat at the top straddling it with a leg on either side. I had two girls on the other side in front of me, and one behind me who was telling me to hurry up. I spent a good couple minutes up there doing another mental preparation and some deep breathing then climbed down to wait for the last girl. At the time, I was thinking that had been one of the scariest things I've done in a while, because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is an irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't even compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground and all four of us split up into the smaller half of the courtyard, looking for any kind of entrance. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention we could really get cut up, so that wasn't an option. 
Searching for a little longer, we didn't find anything that looked remotely plausible, until we found a grate near the base of where two walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before, and upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easy to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than three feet down and two feet wide, but inside, there was another drop down where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small, square landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked amongst ourselves, wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down there, she said. What? Where? I could see his outline, she said. I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was further down than my line of sight and it was too dark. Hello, she called out. He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a couple of chicks, she spat out bluntly. What he said next sent chills down my spine. It was as if I could feel the darkness radiating out of the hole in the ground. All of a sudden, it was very still and quiet, like the darkness had spilled out and weighed all of us down in that gloomy courtyard. He said in what I can only describe as a lustful tone gripping with ill intent. I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was nervousness underneath. Unease. Something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat, like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was and said slowly, that's not cool. The man under that dark earth began laughing maniacally, and not in the kind of way a really good actor does, and the way that we could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked at each other for what felt like hours in that gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there, and now. I was not about to risk some crazy guy coming after us, even if we did outnumber him. The friend scrambled up out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. 15 foot potential fall, and I didn't even have time to think about it. We didn't stop running until we were on the street and halfway down the block out of breath. So guy that was down there, let's not meet again. It was 2012 and my best friend Hannah had convinced me to join her on a weekend trip up north. She had, after searching for the longest time, found her dream car and was planning on traveling the 900 kilometer to the very north of Sweden to buy it. It was a secondhand door Suzuki Vitara in a purplish kind of color and I must admit I didn't share her obsession with it. But with her being the closest thing to a sister that I will ever get, I was happy to join her nonetheless. Hannah and I have always had each other, from the cradle and onwards. Sharing each other's love for adventure, we have traveled the world together. At the time this happened, we were both 21 and had recently returned from a trip in Asia. The man who was selling her the car had agreed to meet us at the small airport in Umeo when we arrived shortly before lunchtime and it started to snow heavily. The first snow of the season, no less. The parking lot was almost empty and when I saw the man standing outside the Vitara, I felt immediately concerned. He was dressed like a hunter. A lot of people in this area of the country live a lifestyle with hunting and fishing, so nothing strange with that really. But still, there was something about him that made me uneasy. He was nice though, smiling and waving to us, shaking hands with us both before walking us around the car and pointing all the tiny little flaws. He showed us the work he had done on the car and showed the paperwork from the recently done engine repairs. He made the impression that he didn't want to hide anything. On the contrary, he made a show out of being very forthcoming and honest. The snowing had now intensified and we were getting cold. He opened the car door for us and said, I got the paperwork at home. Let's close the deal over some coffee. Against all my instincts, I climbed in after Hannah, both of us now trapped in the back seat. I had no reason to feel threatened by this man who had been nothing but pleasant to us other than the alarm bells going off inside my head. I can't tell what it was that made me feel that way, but there must have been some sign that something was wrong, something that my subconscious tuned to. The man was constantly talking. He showed the stereo, told us about the features of the car, about the places we drove past, about the wildlife and the nature. There was not a silent moment. After about 20 minutes, I started to notice that we were in no way moving in the direction of civilization. Instead, it seemed we were driving further and further into the vast wilderness. It struck me that he had us in the back of a two-door car, diving us into unknown territory and no one knew where we were. I looked at Hannah who was happily listening to the man telling stories about the area, and I noticed she didn't look at all worried. Maybe I was totally overreacting. We drove past a group of people standing by the side of the road, hunters planning their day or taking a break maybe. This truly is very different Sweden compared to the city. The car finally stopped outside a small wooden cottage with no neighboring houses apart from a small cabin that we drove past a few hundred meters down the road, but it had looked empty. We followed the man inside. He was still talking non-stop and continued to do so until the moment the door closed behind us. Hannah kept asking things about the car, and I could sense that her voice had a new undertone now, a thin, sharp tenseness that made me wonder if she too had started to feel that something wasn't right. I'll put the kettle on, he said, and as he passed us to go into the kitchen, he let his hand touch Hannah's hair and he smiled smugly. 
May I use the bathroom? I asked politely and made my way to the door with a little red heart on. I was washing my hands when I saw something in the stained bathroom mirror. Something was behind the water cistern. I pulled out a rolled up plastic folder and as I turned the pages, I felt my blood run cold. It was very violent pictures that looked like had been cut out from magazines, and they were glued to the paper. Surrounded by cut up pieces of handwritten text, put it together made a horrifying story about how a woman was lured into a car with the promise of getting to buy the car cheaply, and then it quickly turned into a horror story. I knew this will sound silly, but when we traveled together, Hannah and I had a code word for whenever we felt it was time to get out of a situation. We had never needed to use it, just joked about it, but now it came in handy. I walked out of the bathroom and looked at Hannah and said, Potatoes. You forgot to buy potatoes. And that's too bad, because we really need some. The look on my face must have told her that the situation was no joke and she said, Oh, should we get some as soon as possible? The sooner the better, I replied. Hannah, always pretty and charming and capable of great acting, casually walked over to the man in the kitchen, tapped his shoulder and said, Excuse me, but I was wondering if I can go have a quick look at the cam belt. He upped something about it being in good shape and handed over the keys. We got into the car and speeded off faster than the weather strictly speaking allowed. We left the car at the airport and hoped we hadn't made a terrible mistake. What if he reported it stolen? It would be embarrassing to explain to the police. But nothing happened. He didn't follow us, didn't report it. We had to take the train since we had no plane tickets. The original plan had been to take the car home, and we didn't want to linger closer to the airport in case he came looking for us. Later Hannah asked what made me use the code word, and I told her about what I had found. It might have just been a fantasy, a sick game, and maybe he would never done anything to us. But right then and there, I was convinced we would have died if we didn't get out. I'm glad Hannah didn't need any convincing or proof, just the code word. I truly think that if we hadn't talked about it so many times before, about how we would handle a situation where we need to get out fast, things would have ended differently. Differently. Both of us knew that either of us ever used the code word, it's time to get out, no questions asked, just move. Okay, so I've had a few issues with my next door neighbors since I moved in, but nothing creepy until just recently. There is a man, a woman, and at least one boy living there, and I mostly just avoid them. The man seems okay but a bit weird, and the boy just keeps to himself, and the woman is quite a bit off. Not long after we moved in, she left a note in my mailbox. Our mailboxes are right beside each other, between our houses. Anyway, I stood at the mailbox reading the note. She thought that my dog was using the bathroom in her yard. It was possible, as our friends had some holes in it, that our dog had gotten out then. But those holes had been fixed a long time ago. Still, no big deal, except I noticed her standing in her driveway, just staring at me. And the note was very long, I just kept reading it. The more I read it, the crazier it got, and the weirder her behavior in my peripheral vision became. Apparently I was entitled. She seemed to think I was somehow instructing my dog to use the bathroom in the yard. Her note went on a tangent about how awful dogs are. She was also 100% convinced it was my dog, even though there are always tons of loose dogs, cats, and wildlife wandering around and no doubt traveling through her unfenced backyard. In my peripheral vision, she got into her SUV, backed out of her driveway, then parked it along the street directly behind me and just idled there, staring. The note then went on a weird, long tirade about the previous family to live in my house saying I was Anther Deb, as if I'd have any idea at all what that is even supposed to mean, then concluded in some odd insults and some implied not quite threats. This is the closest thing we ever had to a conversation at this point. I can understand not wanting a dog using the bathroom in her yard, but this was a bit of an extreme reaction as this was literally the first time I'd even heard of there being a problem. A simple note would have done, but this note was insane. She was still staring behind me. I decided to try to ignore her and just go to my house. That's when she shouted out her window, Are you playing a game? The reaction made no sense. Are you nuts? I replied, as I officially ran out of patience. She shouted more nonsense and insults at me while blocking my driveway, which is right next to the mailboxes, with her vehicle, while I repeatedly told her to leave before I called the cops. This went back and forth like this for a while, but she eventually sped off when I pulled my cell phone out. Later, my boyfriend, who had not been home at this time this happened, had a chat with the neighbors. He said they seemed agreeable and reasonable and basically dismissed me of just being dramatic. The woman told a very different version of events, of course. I was annoyed that my boyfriend wasn't taking me seriously, but let it go. I think he just wanted to keep getting along with the man next door, as they sometimes borrow tools. They speak to him a lot differently than how they speak to me. They don't do anything rude to me while he's around. In fact, they don't speak to me when he's around at all. They always wait for him to be away. Anyway, I mostly just avoid them. Sometimes, the woman stares at me, but I just ignore her. Until recently, I've been mostly successful. Here's the creepy story. I don't sleep well at night when I'm home alone, and I'm always home alone now because my boyfriend is out of the country on business for months at a time. I often feel like there's someone just outside my house or at my door. 
Sometimes, my dogs act up at odd hours, but I never see anyone. I keep my house alarm armed and my pistol in my nightstand. The other night was one such night. I didn't sleep well and kept having a sinking feeling that something was wrong. Anyway, I got out of bed at about 2am because I thought I was scheduled to work at 3am. I had mostly given up on getting a restful sleep then anyway. As I left my house, I heard something to my left, the direction of my neighbor's house, but didn't see anything. I was always nervous in my driveway because the motion sensor light was broken, but there was always a lot of darkness between my door and my truck, so I always moved quickly to my driveway. I got in my truck and went to work. It turned out that I misread my schedule and didn't work at 3 that morning after all. Annoyed at the mistake, but grateful I'd get to go home and sleep a little more before the actual start of my shift at 7, I went home. I pulled into my driveway and didn't see anything in the beam of my truck's headlights. I always look around my truck before getting out. I turned the headlight off and got out. I took a few steps ahead of my truck, and then all of a sudden a large man called out to me, shouted really, from the shadows at the corner of my house. He scared me so bad that I screamed, reached for my pepper spray, and fell down. Not useful. He apologized in a tone that didn't sound sorry at all. It was my neighbor, and that wasn't much of a relief. Apparently it was my fault that he occasionally found trash in his yard, in Windy, Colorado. Complaining about this seemed to be a lot more important issue than scaring the heck out of me while I'm alone at night. He showed no real concern or realization that was even wrong at all. Again, I have no problem with neighbors bringing issues to my attention, but seriously, hey, can you make sure trash from your bins isn't blown into my yard is not a question that takes 10 minutes nor is it one that needs to be addressed at 3 in the morning. I'm not in agreement to keep the peace, but I know the trash isn't mine. We live in a windy area. Trash gets blown around in people's yards all the time. No big deal. But he would just not stop going on about it. He kept needlessly repeating himself and made some not quite but kind of threat about getting along. Think about the lines of, it would be a shame if something were to happen, type sort of threats. He was keeping me busy. I didn't even notice his wife flank me. Before I even knew she was there, she appeared from the shadows by a tree. She wanted to yell at me about some eggs. A few weeks ago, I found a bunch of eggs smashed on the road near our shelled mailbox. As the carton was right next to them, I thought the carton had obviously just been dropped. Not that someone was trying to egg anything. I assumed my neighbor had dropped the eggs on her way to get the mail and just left them. She denies this, but I still think that's the most likely explanation because no one else has any reason to be out at our mailbox with eggs. But I didn't care enough to say anything to her about it at the time, so I just let it go and forgot all about it. Now she was accusing me of leaving eggs around, again, inexplicably expressing the grievance at 3am. Weird that she hadn't brought it up weeks ago when it happened, but I know why she didn't. My boyfriend was still here then. My boyfriend has been away on business for several weeks now, long enough for them to have noticed his absence. They were also probably aware that my motion sensor light was out. They sure seemed to know how to avoid my headlight beams. Being surprisingly patient, I explained that I knew nothing about the eggs. I mentioned that I later found a lot of the shells in my yard and figured a squirrel must have carried them there. She proudly informed me that she tossed them onto my yard herself. Apparently she thought that was okay, but someone dropping them in the first place isn't. Anyway, this is where I started to get over my shock a bit and started getting pissed. Initially, I had been somewhat relieved that the man in the shadows had been my neighbor, not some random crazy person, but now I was pissed. I had now been outside with them for like 20 minutes, while they accused me about stupid stuff. While well, I tried to be polite and agreeable even though I had nothing to do with it, but now everything wrong with the situation had just kicked in. I eventually remembered that I don't actually have to put up with any of this and cut her off mid rant and said, it's 3am, I'm going home, Good night," and turned on my heel. I heard her say something in an unkind tone as I left, but didn't catch what it was. They had staked out my house, waiting for my boyfriend to leave and long enough to be sure he was gone, all to complain about some insane stuff long after it supposedly even happened. If they have concerns, surely there are better times to address them than at 3am. What were they doing out at 3am anyway? And that man had totally purposely hidden a shadow at the corner of my house where he could avoid my headlights, and didn't reveal himself until I was out of my truck and exposed. And shouldn't the woman have walked up beside her husband, not gone around while I was distracted? They kept doing odd behavior, Never enough that they're doing anything illegal or anything to report to police, but none of this is normal behavior. Honestly, I think these complaints are just excuses and they're really just taking the opportunity to intimidate me. I think they're messing with me on purpose. Then again, I could be wrong. Either way, I will be installing a motion light soon. I was so shaken up and had my adrenaline so high from someone scaring me from a blind spot by my house. Because seriously, that could have been someone else and a whole lot worse. The story starts several years ago, 
Me and my friends interest in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which is when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom, so we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. Now, keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and were especially drawn if there was an element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips, but we made sure that if we were going into any old building in the dark, we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. We never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't yet snow on the ground, but it was actually a chilly evening. Directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around from the TB area, is a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I can only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. We had been inside the hospital a few times, but never found anything strange, only the occasional sign of others having been or lived there. What was piquing our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to the hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead had to hop over a tall wall and climb a very high fence. A few of us had backpacks, containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a couple bottles of water. So, nothing too heavy or valuable that would get damaged when tossed over the obstacles before us. A little ways off the road, it was dark if you clung to the buildings. We did for a while before stepping behind a small patch of shrubbery, which we determined was an easy way over the first wall since the other way around to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in that corner behind the bushes, no one could see us from the street. I don't believe I went first, but I did not remain behind to be last over that wall. It was too high up for me to jump and haul myself over, so I resorted to stepping on a pipe jutting out somewhere lower along the wall. It gave me a bit of a needed boost, and soon I was up and over, moving into the library's courtyard. Another girl and I waited for our two other girlfriends to join us. Upon an initial glance over at the courtyard, there was no obvious way in. To our right was a dilapidated fountain, which I took joy in imagining springing forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months, people laughing and talking with the surrounding trees bringing them shade. Now, however, it had been in long disuse, and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for years, save the 15 chain link fence directly in front of us separating the courtyard in half. I could tell it hadn't seen the same weather as the rest of the courtyard, because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with a fence like that, someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground rather silently due to their lightness. I was the third over, because I have a slight fear of climbing and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, then sat at the top straddling it with a leg on either side. I had two girls on the other side in front of me, and one behind me who was telling me to hurry up. I spent a good couple minutes up there doing another mental preparation and some deep breathing, then climbed down to wait for the last girl. At the time, I was thinking that had been one of the scariest things I've done in a while, because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is an irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't even compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground and all four of us split up into the smaller half of the courtyard, looking for any kind of entrance. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention we could really get cut up, so that wasn't an option. Searching for a little longer, we didn't find anything that looked remotely plausible, until we found a grate near the base of where two walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before, and upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easy to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than three feet down and two feet wide, but inside, there was another drop down where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small, square landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked amongst ourselves, wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down there, she said. What? Where? I could see his outline, she said. I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was further down than my line of sight and it was too dark. Hello, she called out. He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a couple of chicks, she spat out bluntly. What he said next sent chills down my spine. It was as if I could feel the darkness radiating out of the hole in the ground. All of a sudden, it was very still and quiet, like the darkness had spilled out and weighed all of us down in that gloomy courtyard. He said in what I can only describe as a lustful tone gripping with ill intent. I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was nervousness underneath. Unease. Something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat. Like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was and said slowly, That's not cool. The man under that dark earth began laughing maniacally. 
and not in the kind of way a really good actor does. And the way that we could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked at each other for what felt like hours in that gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there. And now. I was not about to risk some crazy guy coming after us, even if we did outnumber him. The friend scrambled up out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. 15 foot potential fall, and I didn't even have time to think about it. We didn't stop running until we were on the street and halfway down the block out of breath. So guy that was down there, let's not meet again. It was 2012 and my best friend Hannah had convinced me to join her on a weekend trip up north. She had, after searching for the longest time, found her dream car and was planning on traveling the 900 kilometer to the very north of Sweden to buy it. It was a secondhand door Suzuki Vitara in a purplish kind of color and I must admit I didn't share her obsession with it. But with her being the closest thing to a sister that I will ever get, I was happy to join her nonetheless. Hannah and I have always had each other, from the cradle and onwards. Sharing each other's love for adventure, we have traveled the world together. At the time this happened, we were both 21 and had recently returned from a trip in Asia. The man who was selling her the car had agreed to meet us at the small airport in Umeo when we arrived shortly before lunchtime and it started to snow heavily. The first snow of the season, no less. The parking lot was almost empty and when I saw the man standing outside the Vitara, I felt immediately concerned. He was dressed like a hunter. A lot of people in this area of the country live a lifestyle with hunting and fishing, so nothing strange with that really. But still, there was something about him that made me uneasy. He was nice though, smiling and waving to us, shaking hands with us both before walking us around the car and pointing all the tiny little flaws. He showed us the work he had done on the car and showed the paperwork from the recently done engine repairs. He made the impression that he didn't want to hide anything. On the contrary, he made a show out of being very forthcoming and honest. The snowing had now intensified and we were getting cold. He opened the car door for us and said, I got the paperwork at home. Let's close the deal over some coffee. Against all my instincts, I climbed in after Hannah, both of us now trapped in the back seat. I had no reason to feel threatened by this man who had been nothing but pleasant to us other than the alarm bells going off inside my head. I can't tell what it was that made me feel that way, but there must have been some sign that something was wrong, something that my subconscious tuned to. The man was constantly talking. He showed the stereo, told us about the features of the car, about the places we drove past, about the wildlife and the nature. There was not a silent moment. After about 20 minutes, I started to notice that we were in no way moving in the direction of civilization. Instead, it seemed we were driving further and further into the vast wilderness. It struck me that he had us in the back of a two-door car, diving us into unknown territory and no one knew where we were. I looked at Hannah who was happily listening to the man telling stories about the area, and I noticed she didn't look at all worried. Maybe I was totally overreacting. We drove past a group of people standing by the side of the road, hunters planning their day or taking a break maybe. This truly is very different Sweden compared to the city. The car finally stopped outside a small wooden cottage with no neighboring houses apart from a small cabin that we drove past a few hundred meters down the road, but it had looked empty. We followed the man inside. He was still talking non-stop and continued to do so until the moment the door closed behind us. Hannah kept asking things about the car, and I could sense that her voice had a new undertone now, a thin, sharp tenseness that made me wonder if she too had started to feel that something wasn't right. I'll put the kettle on, he said, and as he passed us to go into the kitchen, he let his hand touch Hannah's hair and he smiled smugly. May I use the bathroom? I asked politely and made my way to the door with a little red heart on. I was washing my hands when I saw something in the stained bathroom mirror. Something was behind the water cistern. I pulled out a rolled up plastic folder and as I turned the pages, I felt my blood run cold. It was very violent pictures that looked like had been cut out from magazines, and they were glued to the paper. Surrounded by cut up pieces of handwritten text, put it together made a horrifying story about how a woman was lured into a car with the promise of getting to buy the car cheaply, and then it quickly turned into a horror story. I knew this will sound silly but when we traveled together, Hannah and I had a code word for whenever we felt it was time to get out of a situation. We had never needed to use it, just joked about it, but now it came in handy. I walked out of the bathroom and looked at Hannah and said, Potatoes. You forgot to buy potatoes. And that's too bad, because we really need some. The look on my face must have told her that the situation was no joke and she said, Oh, should we get some as soon as possible? The sooner the better, I replied. Hannah, always pretty and charming and capable of great acting, casually walked over to the man in the kitchen, tapped his shoulder and said, Excuse me, but I was wondering if I can go have a quick look at the cam belt. He upped something about it being in good shape and handed over the keys. We got into the car and speeded off faster than the weather strictly speaking allowed. We left the car at the airport and hoped we hadn't made a terrible mistake. What if he reported it stolen? It would be embarrassing to explain to the police. But nothing happened. He didn't follow us, didn't report it. 
We had to take the train since we had no plane tickets. The original plan had been to take the car home, and we didn't want to linger closer to the airport in case he came looking for us. Later, Hannah asked what made me use the code word, and I told her about what I had found. It might have just been a fantasy, a sick game, and maybe he would never have done anything to us. But right then and there, I was convinced we would have died if we didn't get out. I'm glad Hannah didn't need any convincing or proof, just the code word. I truly think that if we hadn't talked about it so many times before, about how we would handle a situation where we need to get out fast, things would have ended differently. Both of us knew that either of us ever used the code word, it's time to get out, no questions asked, just move. This happened to me two years ago. It was my first month on the job, and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. I'm a 38-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years, so I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. The place I currently work is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartments with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in the back indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers, and real estate agents and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It is located in a well-known tourist town in the United States. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor. The doors are locked at 11 p.m. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you are at. It will ring the company's cell phone and I answer and can come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on first floor are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a code to get in. This was midsummer, and while it's never really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off the keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I am the only security person here at night. A co-worker who was leaving told me the side iron gates that led to the parking lot are open on one side because they are stuck. This is nothing new and they often do get jammed. She told me the repair people would be in tomorrow sometime to fix them but to do just some extra patrol out here tonight. This place sits across the road from a public park and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to bring in homeless at night who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm nor can we detain anyone. We are simply eyes and ears and to call the police if something comes up. Of course, you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases if you are in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I am to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious, watch the cameras in the security office which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for a day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3am. I had just sat down to eat my food when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, thanks for calling, resort name here. This is security officer James, how can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked how can I help. The man started to breathe heavier and laughed in silence. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office into the door he was at when it rang again, this time from call box number 2 which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you, they said in this raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. Then the phone rang again. This time I picked up and before he could speak, I let him know the cops are on their way and to leave the property now as he is on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. The guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they were a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you, the cops won't make it much here in time, they said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. 
I figured it scared them off. I was going to call the police, but honestly, the location of this place, it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here, and I figured this guy was just some homeless guy from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked the back lot just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case, but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. But a half hour passed, I had finished my food and was just about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked up and said my normal line then I heard, Where are the cops? I don't see them but I see you, the voice said. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and did not see anything. I went to the front door to look out there. There was nothing but darkness and a few front floodlights on. I know you're alone, he said. I basically told him to get screwed and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. The next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40 with long, stringy hair poking down in these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest butcher knife I've ever seen and make a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy. He continued slamming his body against the glass trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window but managed to bust his head open, so the window now had blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him and the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on something because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores, but this is the last thing I need with this guy running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones, he would at least be trapped or slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yell the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl and then held that knife up again before running to the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't, and while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time his hood had fallen back. He was bald-headed with wild, long, stringy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge, and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, Die, die, while making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming it into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looks like and I told him I have camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone and he had driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if he came again. It was now nearly 5am when the cop left. I waited until 6am when it was daylight and the people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. This guy literally took all the 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8am, I told her what happened and she said that they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone know who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or who he was. So crazy bloody guy with a knife, let's not meet again. A couple of summers ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in Chequamegon National Forest in northern Wisconsin, and after our experience, we did not plan to return unless we go with a large group of people. My girlfriend and I are from college, so northern Wisconsin was our go-to place for R&R. &R. We've done a number of hiking trips in northern Wisconsin and in the UP, but never to this area. We are not backpacking experts, but we have been to a number of national parks and have been out hiking and exploring when we can find the time away from work. 
We love getting away from people and relaxing in nature, but this trip made us appreciate the presence of other people around us in unfamiliar places. Our plan was to hike a remote section of the North Country Trail. The North Country Trail is a national scenic trail, like the Appalachian Trail, but it gets much less use. In some parts of northern Wisconsin, the trail is very remote, and the only access is via logging roads. We plan to hike 15 miles along the trail to a backpack shelter, spend the night, and hike back to the car the following day. We spent the night at a friend's house in Wausau, and we set out early the next day to the trailhead. As we entered the National Forest boundary, we were captivated by the beauty of the thick green forest. I drove slowly along the gravel logging roads as we made our way to our own parking spot. While we were driving to the trailhead, we passed a couple of people standing next to a parked truck on the side of the road. They appeared to be campers, as they had a rusted out, bunged up pickup truck. As we drove past, I waved, and they stared back without returning the greeting. Friendly people, I thought to myself. After we passed them, I looked in the rearview mirror and noticed they were still staring at us. And before we rounded a bend, I glanced back into the mirror again and saw them watching us through the haze of road dust. My girlfriend and I joked about the up north people, but we did not think anything of the encounter. Aside from those people, we did not encounter anyone else on the remote logging roads within the National Forest boundary. We found the trailhead about 15 minutes later after winding our way on the narrow logging road. There was no one else parked at the trailhead, a perfect chance to get some needed solitude, fresh air, and relaxation. After parking and making sure the car was locked, we hoisted our packs and set off on the trail. The weather was relatively cool, which thankfully kept the mosquitoes and biting flies at bay. We took pictures along the way, and we marveled at the lushness of the forest and the topography of the glacial moraine. After a solid 8 hours of hiking, we found our campsite. It consisted of a wooden backpack shelter and a fire ring. Even though the shelter provided ample space for us, we opted to set up our tent in a small clearing about 100 feet behind the shelter. We built a fire at the shelter fire ring, and I boiled water for our dehydrated trail food. As we ate, we watched the sky slowly turn dark. My girlfriend and I passed around a Nalgene filled with wine, and we marveled at how many stars you could see away from the city. When the fire was reduced to a small pile of glowing embers, we decided to head back to our tent. We settled into our tent and looked through the pictures we took that day. But after lugging a heavy pack for 15 miles and drinking some wine, I was ready for some shut-eye. When we camped at state and national parks, I usually wore earplugs. But that night, there were no RVs or other campers to make noise, so I closed my eyes and let the noise of the forest lull me to sleep. My girlfriend was very uneasy that night, but she normally had some apprehension whenever we were sleeping away from home. I'm not sure when we drifted to sleep, but we awoke to a bone-chilling noise. It was pitch dark outside, and over the insects in the forest, I heard a dull thud. It sounded like someone was hitting two logs together. My girlfriend and I were wide awake at this point, and we lay silently in our tent, hearing the noise again. Our old tent had mesh windows, but the backpacking tent we were using had no window. We could only guess at what was making the sound outside of our tent. We initially thought that an animal had got our food and garbage bag, which we left in the shelter. But the noise was too distinct, and it did not sound like rustling through food wrappers or our camp equipment. Our hearts were pounding as we heard the persistent knock in the darkness. Unarmed and scared, we did not know what to do. I would normally have carried a can of bear spray, but I decided to leave it at home to save on weight, against the wishes of my girlfriend. The knocking continued but we remained still as to not give away our location. For all we knew, whatever was making the noise had already spotted our tent. After what seemed like an eternity, the knocking sound ceased. We lay in complete silence with only the dull buzz of the insects in the background. Then we heard it, leaves rustling, a branch breaking, voices. We heard low talking in the distance. We could not make out what was being said, but it sounded like a couple of people talking in the distance. The voices continued for a bit, but to our relief, the voices did not seem to be getting louder. Whoever was out there did not spot the tent or decided to leave us alone. We sat in our tent for the rest of the night, adrenaline surging through our veins. At the first light, we slowly got out of our tent. I looked around in all directions to see if anyone was out there, but I only saw the forest and the backpack shelter. We quickly rolled up our sleeping bags and camp pads and put our tent away. When we got to the shelter, my girlfriend screamed in horror. On the entrance to the shelter, the wood was freshly cut. The word kill was cut into the shelter wall, and there were a number of axe and knife cuts where someone was chopping at the wall. I looked at the ground and saw a scattering of fresh wood splinters. After grabbing our food supply and garbage bag, we got out of there. We were nearly jogging with our gear as we made our way back to the car. I kept glancing back over my shoulder and gazing out through the woods to see if anyone was following us. We traversed the glacial eskers that we saw the day before, and we knew we were getting closer to our car. We were quietly rejoicing as we neared the trailhead. We made it back to the trailhead in near record time, but something was wrong. 
The windshield wiper on my car was sticking straight up and there was something stuck in the wiper. As we inched closer to the car, I saw there was blood smeared on the windshield and a squirrel carcass was impaled on the wiper blade. Hair and blood still stuck to the wiper and on the hood of the car. I didn't bother cleaning off the car. We threw our gear in the trunk and I sped off without removing the animal from the wiper blade. As I sped down the gravel logging road, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, but I could not see anything through the cloud of road dust behind the car. When we got to a gas station by the nearest town, I removed the carcass with a wad of newspaper, and I tried to remove as much dried blood as I could. I filled up on gas so we didn't stop until we made it to Milwaukee. This was the last trip I took to the woods of northern Wisconsin. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on the Great American Road Trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, pretty broke, and as my mom had been a long haul trucker, I suggested that to save a ton of money, we would sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them up to make curtains. By the end of the first week, we got in so we could set up a camp in about 10 minutes. Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, basically anywhere it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night after the first night where we felt scared until the last week of the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive more than 3 or 4 hours a day. No destination really in mind, outside a few must-see landmarks. We drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of people we met at a campsite, in the back of their pickup, because it got hungry and overheard them saying they were going to go. We met an 80 year old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar, played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm, got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them, spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. Basically, every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look out to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods, following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up to the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if she hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again, staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we'd be obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while it was still light out, we goofed around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out a campfire further down the campsite and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met some pretty cool people in the previous five weeks by just going up and offering beer or just chatting, so we wandered over. Near the campfire there were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off, and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man, who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing, and we spent several hours just chatting up about our trip, families, everything. Then he started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him and he pulled out his camera to show her photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite, and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of us for one of us to go get up to the bathroom in the middle of the night, so the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, if you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I kept waiting for the laugh, or for him to nudge Tez with his elbow. Jokes of the foreigner and the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within 5 minutes, the ranger had come back to it and was talking about how something grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back on. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We would just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to get the conversation going somewhere else. Then the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler to get another beer. At this point, it's pitch black out, and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside of that circle. Suddenly, there's a red dot in the darkness, and it took a moment for me to realize that it's a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen of the digital camera lit up. Now, it wasn't odd for people we met to ask to take pictures with us. 
It was an entirely strange thing to have this person taking a photo of us without asking or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both staring at him like deer in the headlights at this point, but instead of realizing what he was doing was a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things, and takes another photo, this time with the flash. No asking us to smile, no proposing a group photo, and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back to the fire and sits down, not a word said about the photo. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. We make some BS excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and nope the heck out. When we stand to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. Ranger, however, looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, Be careful out there. There's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rushed back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referencing the RV, and jump in the front seats. My friend Tez is all but hyperventilating. Why did he take pictures of us? I was shaking, I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She's in a full panic and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off because now he knows exactly where our car is. That is the only night we not set up camp. We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just put the car in drive and floored it out the campsite. As we got into the dirt road, Ranger was walking towards our car with that same cold expression. Ranger, let's not ever meet again. This happened on a Sunday night when I was about 10 years old in the mid-90s. My family house was on a short street, a dead end created by a railroad track. We had a three-story house, which was the farthest from the tracks, with windows on every floor, two in the basement. The stairs from our bedrooms upstairs led directly to the front door, which connected to a closed-in mudroom slash porch, which also had a screen door and a glass door that only locked from the inside. Even friends and extended family would wait outside to be let into the porch, as that's where the doorbell was. From inside the porch, you could see right up the stairs through the window and the door. Across the house, parallel to the front door was the back door. Both had a large window in them. It must have been June because my older brother had a soccer game, and I only had a week of school left. I personally found watching him struggle on the field and being forced to cheer while being eaten by bugs really boring, and I just got in a box set of books I desperately wanted to be alone with. After about an hour of reasoning and pleading, I finally convinced my parents to let me stay at home alone for the first time while they went to the game. They were only going to be gone for a few hours, and although we didn't live in the best neighborhood, our neighbors were close family friends. I'd be fine. Mistake. Usually before a game we'd all go out and eat together, but since I was staying home, they ordered a pizza from down the street, my brother's favorite. I'd already been face deep in the first book for half an hour when the doorbell rang. Pizza. I walked up from my bedroom and down the stairs to my living room. I got to the bottom of the stairs, and my father was at the door having a conversation with the delivery guy. They were talking about soccer, so I just decided to take the pizzas and keep on keeping on. Which is when I noticed the delivery guy staring at me, intently. He was a middle-aged Caucasian with an accent, and he was smiling at me in a way I recognized. It was the same smile I had on my face when I told my parents I was old enough to spend the evening in the house alone. Fake, but convincing. I walked past him through the living room to the kitchen and threw the pizzas on the counter and shoved my face into my book. My father talked to him for a few more minutes about sports and then closed the door. My family sat down to eat and chat while I forgot all about them, the food, and the delivery guy. Before they left, around 6.30pm, my parents wrote down all the emergency numbers, gave me instructions not to open the door, and headed out with my brother and I waved them off, excited to finally have the house to myself, if only to read in silence. I locked the main door and headed up to my room to read. It was blissfully quiet, save for the sound of my dog's occasional barking in the backyard. I had just finished the first book, and immediately started on the next when the doorbell rang, and my dog lost it in the backyard. I was up in my bed immediately. I looked at my alarm clock for the first time since they left, it read 8pm. My whole family was at the game, and any extended family in the province was as well. No one would be coming over without calling, especially on a Sunday night. The doorbell rang again, and again, again. I remained frozen in place, my book crumpling in my shaking hands. I, for the first time, was completely alone and terrified. My sly kid smile flashed in my mind, I thought I was so clever convincing my parents I wasn't scared to be alone, and then another smile flashed in my memory, the pizza guy. And then the banging started, loud successive bangs that rattled me if not the house. And now from the backyard my dog was livid. I could hear him barking and whining at the back door. I wanted to call someone, but the only phone was in the kitchen, which involved walking right past the front door. I panicked. I was scared to leave my room, as my feet would be visible to whomever it was once I entered the hallway. But what if it was just a neighbor? I checked the alarm clock again and was surprised that only minutes had gone by, and my parents wouldn't be back for an hour and a half, minimum. I'd have to wait it out, so I did. 
I got up as silently as possible and closed my bedroom door. Eventually, all the barking, ringing, and banging stopped. I waited for a half an hour and then opened my door and crept out of my bedroom. I crept down the hallway to the top of the stairs, trying to press myself into the far wall, as out of sight as possible. But all the lights were on, and I realized that it was obvious that someone was home. I peered quickly down the stairs in the window, looking through to the glass porch door, and saw no one. Luckily, no one was there. I tore down the stairs and ran for the back door and checked outside. Nothing but my dog, who was all too happy to run inside. I let him in through a crack and slammed the door after him, locking it, and I realized it hadn't been locked before. I turned to the phone, grabbing it, and about to dial my neighbor's number, when my dog started acting like he was going to the vets. A low growl accompanied by a crouch, backing away. I froze and looked in his direction, then followed his gaze to the window in the inner front door, where inside my porch, past the front screen and glass doors, stood a man I'd never seen before, and he was staring at me, livid. I froze, paralyzed with fear as I looked at him, and I couldn't look away. He was tall, slim, and had bags under his eyes. His hair was shoulder length and unkempt. He lifted his hand and placed it on the window, and then looked down, as he tried to turn the knob, twice, but it was locked. I came out of my paralysis the second his eyes left mine, and I moved quickly to the side of the wall that led to the basement stairs. It blocked us from being able to see each other. Hiding. Hiding felt good. My dog, still in the corner, inched towards me, low to the ground and still growling. I couldn't breathe. My heart was pounding. This couldn't get any worse. Wrong. I saw you, boy. I saw you. Open the door. My stomach nestled in my throat. I started crying. I've never really had a flight or fight moment. Only flight or flight. But there was nowhere to go. Back upstairs led right past him, and going down into the basement seemed even more terrifying, as I'd have to walk past the window in the middle of the staircase that looked out into the alley leading to my backyard. I saw you. You can't hide forever. You have to pay. You have to pay. He screamed through the door window, shaking the door as he pulled on it. I thought he would just break the window and unlock the door, so I descended slowly down to the steps to the basement, going just halfway to put some distance between us. I stood still, waiting, and then silence. For a minute, nothing, and then the sound of the glass door and screen door to the outside opening and slamming. More silence. My dog straightened out, walked over to the top of the stairs, and then looked right past me, and started growling. I can still see you. I see you. I see you, boy, and you have to pay. I jumped and turned my head, and through the window to the alley, I saw his face. He was laying on the ground, staring at me. I see you. I know you're home. I see you. I bolted up the stairs to the inner front door, ripped it open, and then locked the glass door to the porch, and backed up into the living room, closing the main door behind me, locking that too. I ran to the kitchen, grabbed the phone, and unplugged it, and turned back around. He was at the door again, this time outside the porch. I steered myself, and ran up the stairs with the phone, dog in tow, to my parents' bedroom, which was the only room with a working phone jack and a lock on their door. And then the doorbell started to ring. I closed and locked their door behind me, left their light off, and plugged in the phone. I dialed my neighbors, and got their answering machine. I dialed again, no answer. Every ring of the phone was matched by a ring of the doorbell. I called them over and over, finally whispering a message. Tom, it's Kevin. I managed trying to get into the house and I'm alone. I peered out of my parents' window and looked down into the front yard. He was still there, pacing, walking up and down the stairs, looking in the windows, walking out of sight as he entered the alleyway, and then back into the front. I noticed my neighbor's car wasn't there. They weren't even home, and it still hadn't occurred to me to call 911, so I hunkered down and waited for my dog, watching from the corner of the window. He walked back up the porch, tried the door, and then the doorbell went off a few more times and then he walked down the stairs and headed back out into the street. He walked a bit down the sidewalk away from the dead end, towards the main road and then stopped, and turned around, walking back towards the house. He stopped again and looked up, directly at the window I was looking through, but the room was dark, he couldn't see me. Instead of turning back around, he continued walking down the street, and crossed the street when he reached the train tracks. He walked back up the other sidewalk, staring at my house all the while, and kept going until he reached the main intersection, and turned the corner. I stood in the corner of the window, watching the street for what seemed like hours, until my parents' car pulled up in front of the house, along with the neighbor's car. They all got out and my mother headed towards the house while my father started chatting with the neighbor's husband. I unlocked the door and booked it downstairs, instantly crying with relief as I unlocked the inner door, and then the glass porch door. I recounted the night's events to my parents in the kitchen through tears, and they had just started to call me down. And that's when the doorbell rang. I started to shake and cry again, and my father burst out of his seat and barreled towards the door and swung it open. And there he was, the man. He stood there smiling a disgusting smile, and I immediately took off down into the basement. My mother was right behind me. 
I heard my father and him arguing loudly for a few minutes and then my father slamming the door. My father called my mother and I back upstairs, and then after I made him promise the man was gone, I walked up into the kitchen. My father sat me down and explained the situation. Earlier, my father hadn't had enough cash on him for the pizzas. He had told the delivery guy that he would be back in 4 hours, but had to make the game and didn't have time to get more cash. The delivery guy agreed, wished my brother good luck in his game, and then had passed the message onto the guy who would be working the closing night shift. The delivery guy had misunderstood, thinking that he was to return immediately and collect payment. He explained it all to my father as if he had rang the doorbell a few times, and then had left. Not that he had been circling the house terrifying me for over an hour. He told my father he wasn't sure if anyone was home, so he looked around back, but only saw my dog. So he left, only returning, coincidentally, minutes after my parents returned, armed with a convincing story. Kids have such an imagination. Sorry that I frightened him. Suffice it to say, but I brought my books with me to every soccer game after that. This happened a couple weeks ago. I'm 17 and my parents were out of state for the month on vacation. I live in a small, nice neighborhood that has quite a distance from any other neighborhoods around us. My neighborhood likes to be involved with each other, so there's always neighborhood summer barbecues and neighborhood parties now and then. Everyone always attends to these, so I'm very familiar with who lives in the neighborhood as I can name off a majority of them. My neighborhood is always dead quiet after 9pm as the kids are inside by then and families are usually heading off to bed. I meant to spray paint art and I decided I wanted to work on a painting in my garage at around 10pm because it was cooler by then. Mind that the garage door is fully open. I'm setting out a tarp so I can start painting when I hear someone walking on the sidewalk. I look up expecting to say hi to a neighbor going on a late night walk around the neighborhood. Instead, it's a man I thought I couldn't recognize at first glance due to it being dark and the only descent light source around was from the garage. He was at least 6 foot 3, lanky, and looked completely normal from what I could see. The man stood at the end of my driveway facing me. With the little light stretching across the driveway hitting his face, I didn't recognize him. I live in a very friendly state where we're usually nice to strangers and make conversations. I thought nothing suspicious as he could have been just a neighbor I wasn't familiar with, so I just struck up a conversation like I usually do. Hi, how's it going? Uh, hi, it's going good so far. Sorry, I don't really recognize you because it's so dark. Oh, I'm Xavier. I don't think I've ever met you before. Did you just move into the neighborhood or something? Uh, yeah. I moved into the corner house up the street. You moved in with the Millers? Yeah, the Millers. I moved in with them. They're my cousins and they're letting me stay with them until I figure some things out. I thought nothing of this, as this seemed normal for a family to let a member of theirs stay with them for a while and the Millers are just those kind of people. Well, I better get going. I need to finish something. It was nice meeting you, Lainey. I never introduced myself, I think. Oh, the Millers told me all about you. I thought nothing of this as well because I would babysit the Miller's kids frequently and my family is close with them. Xavier kept walking and I thought nothing of what just happened and started painting. The next morning I went on a run to my high school that was about 3 miles away. My high school is on a common road that always has cars on it. As I was nearing the school, I heard a car pull up behind me. I stopped running and turned around to see a beat up car with the windows rolled down. A smiling man was sitting in the driver's seat. He looked to me in his mid to late 20s and he had a fairly handsome face. Hi. I probably had a confused look on my face as I didn't recognize the man, but I knew his voice from somewhere. Xavier? We met the other night. Oh, hi. Sorry. I didn't recognize you. It's fine. Hey, you're pretty far from home. That's quite a long run. Aren't you tired? I can give you a ride home if you like. Oh no, it's fine. I like running. Thanks for the offer though. Wanna go out for a cup of coffee? No thanks. I don't drink coffee. We don't have to get coffee then. I'll pay for you. Come on. I wanna go get something with you. No thanks. I'm not really interested. Oh come on. Let's go. Hop in. He reaches over to open the passenger door and beckons me to come in. At this point, it's clear that I don't want to go and I step off from the grass and back onto the sidewalk. I said no, sorry. Come on, just get in the car. It's not a big deal. I gotta go. Some friends are expecting me. That's when I fall and sprint to the school's track and called a friend to pick me up. While waiting at the track for my friend to pick me up, Xavier's beat up car goes down the road, away from the direction of my neighborhood. Few bad things happened in my city, so I didn't think much of what happened and shook it off, which was stupid of me to do. A couple of days later there was a neighborhood barbecue. Although my parents weren't home, I didn't mind going to the barbecue alone because it's always a blast. I hung out with my neighborhood friends like I usually do. I saw the Millers and had a friendly conversation with them, which soon turned to, oh I met Xavier the other night. The Millers didn't know who I was talking about. They said they didn't know any Xavier. No family member moved in with them. I told them about what happened at the school the other day while I was on my run. The Millers and I are freaking out about now. They call over one of our neighbors who's a cop. We'll call him John. John lives a couple houses down from me. I tell him about the confrontations I had with the guy and what he looks like. He told me to call him or the cops if I didn't feel safe or if I encountered the guy again. John patrolled around our neighborhood for a few weeks. Neighbors kept a lookout for Xavier and didn't let their children out late. There was no son of Xavier for two weeks. I got back from a friend's house late at night. 
I pulled into the garage and went inside, turned on the lights, and I was making something to eat. Then there was a soft knock on the front door. It was late. I got back from a friend's and my guard was down so I walked across my house like I usually do. From the front door, you can hear footsteps if someone is walking to the door normally and not trying to hide their steps. I thought it was just a friend. I looked through the peephole and saw a wide smile that belonged to Xavier. He was at my door, late at night and he had a large backpack with him. He heard my footsteps and I could hear him say, I'm sorry about last time. I didn't mean to be like that Laney. It was just a bad day, through the door. I wanted him to go away. I meant to yell, get away from me, through the closed door but all that came out was a lame whimper. I just came to apologize, open the door, I don't mean any harm. He tries to wiggle the doorknob, his voice in constant pestering gets louder and louder. At this point I'm freaking out and I couldn't think at all. I couldn't remember where I put my phone. My family doesn't have a house phone either. Xavier began pounding on the door and repeatedly pushing on the doorbell and kept repeating, open the door Laney, open the door, they're waiting for us. My dog heard the ringing of the doorbell. I don't think he heard the soft knock because he was upstairs somewhere, but when my dog hears the doorbell, he's always excited to go look out the front window and see who's standing on the porch. If it's someone he recognizes, he'll just stand there quietly looking at them until one of us opens the door. When it's someone he doesn't recognize, he barks. He's a German Shepherd and his aggressive bark is very loud. My dog comes running down the stairs, looks at the window and he doesn't recognize Xavier, so he starts barking at him from the window. Xavier laughs and I hear him say, They never told me you had a dog. You're smarter than they said you were, Laney. With my dog barking, I guess I snapped back into my senses. I realized I left my phone in my car in the garage. I called the cops and John. By the time they got here, Xavier was gone. I gave a description to them and they drove around the area for an hour looking for the guy, but they never found him. I stayed at a relative's house for a couple of days until my parents got back and we changed all the locks in the house and installed a security system along with floodlights. My parents had me on lockdown. John patrols around the neighborhood for a while after his shift ends every night now. Xavier, let's not meet again. I'm from the middle of nowhere, born and raised, which can get awfully boring. In order to shave off boredom in my particular little corner of nowhere, my friends and I often enjoy something called contra dancing, which is basically New England folk dancing, where one pairs off with a different, random partner at each dance. This hobby would bring us to all corners of the area and in contact with lots of interesting and usually older people. One night, a friend and I had driven about 40 minutes into the woods to this old townhouse. It's an incredibly scenic little area, even at night, great view of the stars, crickets chirping, people dancing in the tiny town hall. A perfect hot summer night with friends and about 60 others, again mostly old town folk. I had even made cookies for everyone to enjoy, which was announced at the beginning of the dance and was applauded by everyone there. I had danced maybe two dances when an older man in his mid-sixties approached me for a dance. This was far from unusual, in fact, most of my dance partners were over 40. I had seen this guy at several contra dances, so he definitely wasn't new. This guy came off kinda creepy though. Most of the older guys struck 18 year old me as grandfatherly, but some just are uncomfortable to be close to. I refused him, saying I promised my friend a dance. He insisted that I dance the dance after with him. Not wanting to be rude, I agreed, trying to be as perky as possible so he didn't know he was making me uncomfortable. You look so beautiful tonight, was the first thing out of his mouth when we paired up for the dance. I kind of just smiled and nodded, I didn't want to be encouraging. He was sweaty, had a walrus mustache, and was bald except for crown of grey hair. The dance was a particular extravagant one, with a move called a gypsy, when the partners stare into each other's eyes while circling around each other, into a swing. He started making remarks under his breath during this move, such as, get over here and can't get away from me, while pulling me closer. Gross, but nothing too bad. I heard you made the cookies, they were delicious. I'll have to get the recipe out of you, or just make you my wife. Then I have them all to myself. I almost stopped the dance to get away from him, but I shut down and refused eye contact and conversation. I was sufficiently grossed out, but it was nothing too bad. I pulled my friend aside after and told her about him, and then enjoyed the rest of my night. After summer dances, the young people often drive down to a small pond and swim to get off the sweat and grossness of the dance. Skinny dipping is encouraged, as this spot is really in the middle of nowhere, no houses around, and an absolute amazing view of the stars. My friend and I spent about 20 minutes hanging out in the water, with people slowly leaving until we were the only ones left. That's what I thought at least. Until I saw a figure standing at the bank of the pond staring out at us. I didn't call out, assuming it was one of our friends. I swam closer, starting to get out of the water. It wasn't until I was actually fully out of the water, clothed only in a t-shirt and underwear, that I recognized the old man from before. I lurch a fear and wrongness I felt in that moment I will never forget. I have never seen anyone above the age of 25 go down to the pond with us, and he was fully clothed and not there for a swim. He also wasn't saying anything. Shannon, we have to go now. I yelled back at her. The pond bank was narrow and it was hard to scramble around him. 
I was pretending I couldn't see him, that he wasn't there, or that I didn't care he was there. Shannon was about 20 feet behind me when he turned to follow me back to the cars. The rocks were painful to walk on and made it hard to move quickly. I heard you guys were coming down here, he said. At this point, Shannon was just coming near him. She did not recognize him from earlier stories, it wasn't reacting to the creepiness as strongly as I was. Haha, <laughs> yeah, sometimes we cool off down here, Shannon replied. He got between me and her, blocking her from the car. You know, you and your friend look like sisters. I heard she made the cookies. Do you cook as well as her? I'd love a pair of you at home. This is when the situation really hits Shannon. We're alone with this guy who's apparently followed us to the middle of nowhere with unknown intentions. It was nice talking to you, but we have to go now. Come on, Shannon. I was practically running to the car, throwing the words over my shoulders. He put a hand on Shannon's bare shoulder, which spurred her after me. Come on, you two. I'm just trying to have some fun. I was already in reverse by the time Shannon got in the car with me. We tore out of the dirt road at about 50 miles per hour and hit pavement at around 70. I almost puked when I saw headlights turn out from the road, following us. Since I was about 40 minutes from home through all the back roads, I took a gamble and headed towards the nearest gas station, followed the whole way. We stopped at the station, right in front of those huge windows in front. He slowed down, looked at us, and then sped away. I haven't seen him at a contra dance since, which is the scariest thing to me, as he used to be a regular. In my experience, contra dancers are a loyal bunch, but this guy just sort of drifted in for a couple months and disappeared just as quickly. Still makes me uncomfortable to think about. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Here is a little bit of background. I was 20 at the time. I moved in with my uncle in San Antonio, Texas with the agreement that I didn't have to pay rent as long as I helped him out with chores and my cousins. I got a job at a super known coffee chain downtown close to the touristy part of the area. We had a lot of regulars and a lot of homeless coming in and out. I felt relatively safe though because I got to know the people there and it was almost always a lot of foot traffic. I used to even take walks after work in the area, especially since I was super close to the river walk. Skipped to a couple of months into the job and I was friends with everyone I worked with. We were all super close. On this particular day, it was one of my co-workers last day. There was about three guys who had been in there almost all morning. They hadn't bought anything and were just hanging out which was not unusual for my location. On my break I decided to walk down to a nearby drugstore so I can get a farewells card and maybe a small gift for said co-worker. I walked out and put my earphones in and before I could press play I hear the door open behind me and footsteps following behind. Whoever it was caught up to me and started walking beside me matching my pace exactly. I turned to look and it was one of the guys that had been there all morning. He was a bit taller than me. He tried to ask for my number and I kindly told him no. He persisted and I with a short temper told him to screw off. He stopped and stared at me in surprise. He stood there as I walked away and by the time I went back they were gone. I proceeded to tell my coworkers about the encounter and we laughed it off. I thought that would be the end of it. I was wrong. Every shift after that he would already be there just hanging out or would walk in mid-shift. Sometimes with somebody else and sometimes by himself. I assumed he was just another homeless person because how else was he always able to be around? My shifts were sporadic. Some days I opened, some days I closed, some days I worked mid but it didn't matter he was always there. At that point I started feeling paranoid. I would always catch him staring in my direction. He never ordered anything, never talked to me, and luckily wouldn't follow me. He would just sit there, watching me. I started mentioning it to my co-workers and they started noticing it too. One of my team leaders would help me out by sending me to wash dishes in the back or organize the cooler. My co-workers would also try and place themselves to try and block me from his view. I started feeling uncomfortable at work. Sometimes when I closed a co-worker would walk me to my car before heading home themselves. Or if I didn't close they would walk me to my car and turn around and head back to work. Then one day of him just staring, I was working the register that day. He walked up and ordered a water. I asked for his name for his order. I now had his first name just in case. He took his water and sat down. I had mentioned him before to my manager, but because he hadn't really done anything, we couldn't do anything beside note it in the manager book. The next day I worked with my manager. It was him, two of the co-workers, and me. I told them I had to go to the bathroom real quick. There were two bathrooms right next to each other, but sort of hidden from the coffee bar and register and they weren't gender specific. I walked around the bar to the lobby area, I had to pass this table and walk down the lobby to get to the bathrooms. I noticed him get up before going inside the bathroom. I sat down to do my business when someone rattled the knob. I shouted out that it was occupied, but whoever it was kept rattling the door until I finished. When I opened the door, no one was there, and walking back I noticed him adjusting back into his chair. I was super freaked out and told my boss. 
He couldn't tell him anything because we had no proof that it was him. Later that shift he got up and picked up a coffee from the pickup area. My boss assumed that he had ordered it and let him take it. I told him it wasn't and that it wasn't even his name. My boss used this as an opportunity to tell him if he does something like that he can't come back. The man apologized and actually stuck to the rules every day after that. He went back to just watching me. Cut to Valentine's Day. One of my team leaders and I would be scheduled to work certain Thursdays after close to deep clean the store. We would stay until 1am. This was one of those Thursdays. We were almost done and I had to clean the bathrooms as one of the last chores. I finished and as I walk out the bathroom I see him peeking in with both his hands, pressed to the window eyes wide just staring at me with this super intense look. I froze for a second just staring back. I notice on one of his palms that is pressed to the window a purple foam heart. He doesn't move at all. I freak out and run back into the bathroom. I shout, Hannah Hannah, he's here, he's back. She barely hears me through the music we were blasting. Hannah was the team lead who would help me hide me from him so she knew the huge fear I had towards him. She walks towards the bathroom shouting back, what are you saying, what's going on? As soon as she gets close she sees him. I told her again, he's here, he's watching me. She started shouting through the window, you need to leave, if you don't leave we're calling the police. I step out a little to see if he'll leave and he's ignoring her and his eyes were fixated in my direction. I step back into the bathroom and my lead continues to shout at him to leave and threatens him with the police. About 5 minutes pass and he realizes that I'm not stepping out until he leaves so he does. The next day my lead and I told my manager I want to file a police report and he tells me to wait until he talks to his boss. He shows up again that day and I was only there to talk to my manager and leave right after. When I got home, a friend convinced me to call the cops. So I text my boss that I don't care what he or his boss says, I'm scared, and I'm gonna file that report. I dial 911 and tell them a summarized version. They tell me they're going to send someone to where I live to take the official report. The two officers were nice and supportive. I told them my whole story and how my boss didn't feel the need to get cops involved since I wasn't harmed. The officers told me that I should have called right away and defend me saying they could get him for harassment. I thank them and they tell me that if he shows up to dial 911 so they can take him in for trespassing and harassing. I think that day my manager banned him and warned him because he never showed up to the coffee shop again. A few months later when I was comfortable again with downtown, I went out with some friends to walk around. We were close to where I worked at and as we round a corner I see him and so I ducked into a little corner store and my friends follow. I told them I saw him and they kept an eye out. Once he was out of view we left the store and that was the last time I saw him. I just hope that he never comes back. I'm in a school still and work for my family member on certain weekends at a local college selling concessions at the stadium. It's about once twice a month and the stadium is off towards the edge of town. It's Friday night and I just gotten out of school and I had to go straight to work. I get to work, work for 4 hours, half shift tonight, and my boss, my aunt, tells me we need more spoons for tomorrow's event. We sell ice cream, and these events have like 5,000 plus people at them. I say okay and I'll go grab them on my way home. The only store open with heavy duty spoons is all the way on the other side of town, and I still wanted to go meet up with some of my friends and mess around. I decide to take the faster but more sketchy way around the outskirts of town. I live in a weather bipolar state. It snowed last night but I figured the roads would be fine enough even if they weren't plowed. I take off to the store and the first 5 minutes go by and nothing's wrong. I haven't seen a single car or any buildings the entire time, but keep in mind it's approaching 9pm and I'm on the outskirts of town, and no one really takes this way in case they really have to. All of a sudden I see something in the corner of my eye, and it looks like a man, roughly 5 foot 8 I'd say, wearing shorts, t-shirt, and a backwards hat. He's in the ditch, walking in snow when it's 10 degrees out. My first thought is to pull over, but I'm on the phone with my mom at the time and she warns me not to as some things have happened before in this town. I consider stopping, but for some reason I tell myself not to. I wasn't really worried about anything. I pass the man, going about 40 miles per hour. Like I said, roads aren't the best. I drive not even 500 feet past him, and immediately, a car that I did not see at all before turns on and pulls out of a field entrance off the road and starts to follow me. At first I thought I just was focused on the man in the ditch and didn't see a road and that's where they come from, but I later found out there was not a road there. I start to approach the town again and have to take some turns to get to where I'm going. I turn left, the car turns left. I turn right, the car turns right. I go around a roundabout and skip my turn and go twice as no one else was there. Car follows. At this point I start to worry a little, but maybe they just need to go to the store also. I then pull up to a stop sign and I turn without my turn signal. The car follows. Now at this point I should have went straight to the police station, but I still didn't think much of it. I'm 2 miles from the store, where plenty of people will be. I take a few more turns and the car continues to follow me. 
I completely blew a stop sign at a non-busy intersection and the car does a quick stop and go and catches up. At this point, I have two turns till the store so I'm still not worried. I turn into the store and the car turns also. The store also has a gas station, so I pull there first to act like I was getting gas. The car sets off to the side of the road, in between gas station and store, and just sits there. I wait about 10 minutes and the car doesn't move. At this point, I start to get worried. I call my friends I'm supposed to meet up with later on and give them the license plate for worst case scenario, then take off to the store. I cross the street and the car comes straight behind me. I'm freaking out on the phone, not knowing if I should call the cops or not. I go and park as close as possible to the store, and the car parks three rolls behind me and a couple down. It's getting late at this point and the store's closing soon, there's only a couple others in the lot. I turn my truck back on and go park on the complete opposite side of the lot, get out and I completely bolt inside the store. I get spoons and take my time in the store. I go to call my friends to walk back outside and my phone is dead. I look out the sliding doors and suddenly there's a white van next to my driver's side. Looks like no one's in it but the back windows are covered and it's running. I run to customer service and explain everything, but they think I'm some young kid messing around. At that time, I didn't see the original follow car, but no way I'm going outside with that van next to my truck. After waiting for about 30 minutes, the van pulls forward, and the original car appears from the side of the building. I wait another 10 minutes and dash outside. I speed to my friend's house, and when I get there, I park at his garage. My one buddy asked why there's a big orange mark on my tire, and my heart sinks. When I was inside, the follow car must have marked my tire. After inspecting the rest of my truck, we find a small pipe dropped in the bed of my truck surrounded by snow. It was wrapped in duct tape. It was not mine. I was alone, no phone, scared, in a part of town I'm not familiar with. I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked outside. Last December, I was visiting my family down in Florida and we spent some time in Treasure Island. My brother and I took my dog down to the beach at about 2am to play some fetch and drink and have a good time. If you walk along the water, you can reach a few restaurants and bars and hotels that line the beach. Out of nowhere, we see someone walking pretty quickly in our direction from over there and a few minutes later, we can make out that they're being followed. My dog is arguably pretty well trained, we work search and rescue, and I've never once had her run off without permission and never once has she not instantly returned when called, but that changed that night. She was about 5 feet from me and I saw her hackle shoot up and I went to grab her collar but she took off in a full sprint, making some truly terrifying barking and growling sounds. We obviously took off after her and she reached the first person and stopped between them and the people behind them. She was barking and growling and lunging and I finally caught up and put her on a leash. She's never reacted in that manner so it was scary. The group following her ended up being three men that were probably in their early 30s. They started booking it in the other direction. I turned around and the person being followed was a young woman around my age. We asked if she was okay and she just broke down in tears and collapsed into my brother. So she got into her phone and rang her friend's number to have us talk to her. We were able to figure out where she was staying and walk her back to her hotel where we met up with her friends and we all exchanged numbers to talk a later time. The next day we all got together where we learned she had gone out for a walk on the beach, stopped for a drink at the bar, drank a bit and then just wasn't feeling right. So she left the bar and soon noticed three men left after her. She had been walking for about a mile at that point, terrified and slowly getting more and more screwed up. She doesn't remember much about that night and we knew she was probably on something, but we had no clue she'd been drugged. We're still friends now and we're all going to meet up for spring break when we're all back in Florida. I've never been more proud of my dog and more grateful that we were in the right place at the right time. I hate thinking about what could have happened. I'm an extremely outdoorsy female and love to spend a lot of time in nature. I spent the better part of my early 20s living in remote northern locations and exploring a lot of Alaska, Yukon, and British Columbia. I have many odd, frightening, and bizarre stories that came up from my time in the north, and this is one of them. In the summer of 2012 when I was 22, I'm 26 now, I was living and working in a pretty remote town in northern British Columbia from May to September. The place I worked at was a campground in the provincial part of the Alaskan Highway. 4 hours north of Fort Nelson and 2 hours south of the Yukon-British Columbia border. The best part about this park was the fact that it had beautiful natural hot springs, which attracts tourists from all over North America every summer. I lived in an old trailer on a separate part of the campground where the rest of the staff lived. I quickly got used to living in a place where I had no running water, no electricity, no cell phone service, and no internet, and driving 4 hours to Fort Nelson every 2 weeks to get groceries and do my laundry. Life was pretty sweet. I got to hike, go for late night dips in the springs, make some traveling friends, and spend quality time in nature getting to know the flora and fauna of the landscape. My job at the campground was being a park facility operator, gatehouse attendant, 
wildlife interpreter, and sometimes had a few security shifts here and there. The feeling of living in the woods was much different than the feeling of living in a city, as far as safety goes. In the city I'm from, there are people around. You're aware of the fact that your house or apartment could get broken into, but emergency services are quick to respond and neighbors are also a plus. However, in the woods, I felt more vulnerable. The closest police were four hours away and I lived in a trailer that was run down enough that it could easily get broken into. Plus, it was pretty dark and anyone could sneak around easily at night. One night, at probably around two in the morning, I'm asleep inside my trailer and I'm awoken up to a very loud banging on my trailer door. Reasonably shaken, I look outside the window next to my bed and see a car with its lights on and two men standing at my door. I can feel the blood drain from my face. Through the door I say how can I help you and one of the guys, clearly hammered out of his mind, starts rambling on about something. No matter how hard I try, I cannot understand what he is saying. I say sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me and the other guy starts frantically trying to explain something in the same drunken state as the first guy. I decide at this point that they don't mean any harm and I open the door to talk to them. They look visibly shaken and I can tell they are desperate for my help but don't have the mental capacity of a person sober enough to coherently tell me what's wrong. One of the dudes starts telling me a very long story that I managed to piece together through all of his slurring and hiccuping. Basically he says that him and his friend are on vacation, came up from Fort Nelson to party, they had a really long drive, were at the hot springs, they were having beers, and they were sorry about having beers. And then he drops the bomb that somebody's running around the campground, stabbing people. I look at the guy telling me the story and notice he has blood all over his clothing. I say, someone is going around stabbing people? And he replies, yes, someone's running around stabbing everybody. Then the other guy yells, come on, let's go, and they hop into the aforementioned car and speed off before I can question them any further. Now I'm standing at my trailer door, in the darkness, alone, thinking there's a maniac running around wielding a knife. I have no phone and I know that the only person who has a phone is the ranger, and his cabin is about a 5 minute walk away from my trailer. I remember that I have a radio so I run inside my trailer, lock the door, and try to get the ranger on the radio. His radio is off of course. The only thing I can do at this point is go to the ranger's cabin and notify him of the situation. I get to the ranger's cabin and pound on his door. He answers within a few minutes, visibly sleep deprived. And I tell him the whole story. While I'm there he calls the police and they tell him that they are on the way and they will be there in 4 hours. The ranger grabs my gun, walks me back to my trailer and says don't let anybody in. I stay up the rest of the night, listening for any sort of disturbance around me, the intense kind of listening where you're concentrating so hard on any external sounds that might be made that you almost feel deaf from the silence. After about two hours of doing this, my trailer starts rocking back and forth. I freeze. My heart drops. I can hear the sound of someone breathing extremely heavily and I'm thinking, this is it. I'm just sitting there on my bed in my trailer as it's rocking, waiting for the maniac to stop tormenting me and just break the window and stab me. I'm still listening intently to the heavy breathing and that's when I hear a grunt, a very non-human sounding grunt. I get a feeling that it's not what I think it is and I peer out the window of my trailer and a bison is scratching its back on the side of my trailer, causing it to rock back and forth. The RCPM get there at around 6.30am and proceed with their investigation for 10 hours. They close off the springs in the entire campground. We don't hear anything about what took place during the night until the investigation is over. Apparently there was a guy at the springs who made a lewd comment about one of the females in another group, which resulted in an argument. The guy disappeared and returned an hour later with a knife, stabbed two of the guys in the group, and booked it back to Fort Nelson. Not before stopping at my trailer with his buddy to tell me about the incident of course. Yeah, one of the guys at my trailer, he was the dude stabbing people. My guess is that him and his friend stopped by my trailer to try to make it seem like they were innocent. Drunken logic. The two guys that were stabbed survived, which is good. I just hope that I never have to wake up to someone like that at my door again. A couple of years ago, I was still adjusting to the adult dating scene. I was using Tinder, and though I had been on a few dates and had a few hookups, it was mostly just situations where I either wasn't that interested in the guys, or it was strictly a one night stand. It was a college town, not where I went to school, about 45 minutes from my parents' house, and I went on a few dates there. It's a cool city to hang out in, so it was always worth the journey even if a date didn't work out. I started chatting with this guy who I matched with on Tinder. He wasn't exactly my usual type, but he was charming enough. He was a little bit of the stoner slash alternative type. He was funny and confident over the phone as well. I usually made it a rule for myself to chat on the phone at least once or twice before meeting up with guys even just to gauge if we would be able to carry a conversation. It's not the same when you're only texting. We hit it off over the phone well enough to the point where I felt we should give hanging out a shot. We talked about how I went to karaoke night often at a local bar close to where I attended school. He said he and his friends liked going to karaoke too. Great. He lived in the previously mentioned college town and I agreed to attending karaoke night with him and his friends. 
He said they were hanging out at a local coffee shop near where he and his roommate lived, and I could meet them there. A girl he knew worked there as well, and he said she'd give me a coffee on the house. Before leaving, I texted one of my friends where I was going, just to be safe. When I arrived, I could clearly see into the coffee shop. I could see a group of four scraggly looking dudes, and one girl behind the counter. As soon as I pulled up, I got a nagging bad feeling in my stomach. As soon as I got out of the car, the guy I had been chatting with left his group and came out. He said they were leaving right now so we should just go. Not that I really cared about the coffee, but what happened to the coffee I was promised. I asked exactly what the plan was and he said they were going to head back to his place before heading to karaoke. He didn't ask if I wanted anything from the shop and didn't even ask if I wanted to come in. By this point, his friends came out and they all got close to my car. I was getting pretty bad vibes at this point. He isn't acting charming or funny like before on the phone. Everything felt forced. There was an air from the group that they were only pretending to be friendly. Nobody introduced themselves, but they just kept saying how awesome karaoke at the bar was. The girl inside at the counter had gone in the back of the shop and because she was friends with them, I didn't know if I could trust her. Thinking quickly, I said the plan sounded great and I could drive and meet them there, that I didn't want to leave my car there. This apparently was a problem. The one car in the parking lot, which I assumed was one of theirs, was the girls. They said they walked there, but it would be a lot better and faster if I just drove them back to the house. At this point I'm freaking out a bit. Everyone's close to my car and me. I tell them a stupid lie and say that I have a bunch of stuff from school in my car, and it's pretty messy on top of that, so not everyone will be able to fit in. Mind you, they are right by my car, standing in front of it. They can see through my windshield into it. It's got like a backpack in it, and that's just it. I just lie and say I'm kind of embarrassed because the floor is messy. I'm saying anything I can get to get out of this. I tell them I'm really sorry, but if they order an Uber, I could just meet them at their place. I'm not budging on not letting them get in my car. The guy I'm supposed to be on a date with tells the other guys to head back inside the coffee shop, and now I'm alone with him. He asks why I can't just drive everyone. He tells me it's not a big deal, and that it's just easier if I just drive everyone there. I stand firm that there's not room and my car's messy. I tell him I promise to meet him at his place if they order an Uber or walk, just text me his address. He says that it'll take too long to get back to his place, so I should just meet them at the bar instead. He won't give me his address. He texts me the address to the bar, and I apologize about the car thing. I tell him I'm so excited for karaoke and I'll meet him there. I smile and act as naturally as possible, and then I get in my car and try to drive normally while in view. As soon as I'm out of sight, I take off and just drive in different directions haphazardly before heading back home. I was constantly watching in my mirrors to see if anyone followed me, and thankfully nobody did. Not long after arriving home, I got multiple texts from him. He told me I was just another girl pretending to be nice and that I deserved to die. Clearly I made the right call. I blocked his number and blocked him on Tinder. I never heard from him again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s, I remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had taken my sister and I out to a movie, and then to get ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on her report card. I remember my dad had gotten off work later than usual, so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream, it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though, my parents were happy and proud of my sister, we had a great time, and we took up our time getting home. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30, bedtime was usually 10 so I went straight to my room to put my pajamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember thinking that it seemed a little more chilly in the house that night, but that's the only thing out of the ordinary I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew it was bad because I heard fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really bad. I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there, and her and my parents were standing very close. My mom looked like she was on the verge of panic and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked my mom what was wrong, but she didn't want to tell me. She said we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door, I heard my dad talking to a 911 operator and telling them that when we got home, he found out her back sliding glass door shattered and objects strewn about the kitchen. He went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me. The police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside and flashing lights illuminating our entire street for hours. They never found anybody in our house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. The thing that gets to me is that nothing was stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did take was our canned food out the pantry and stack them into a small pyramids on our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to a different parts of the house. 
It was like someone had been in our home and did things for reasons that only made sense to them. As the police were finishing up and ready to leave, I heard one of them ask my mom a question. They talked quietly, and I'm sure they thought I didn't hear. I pretended not to be listening, but I heard everything. We kept magnetized letters on our fridge, and we used them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mom if the message on there that night was done by any of us. It wasn't. I watched my mom turn pale when we told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day. It said, always watching. The police didn't find any fingerprints. They said the intruder had to be wearing gloves. For the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. Within a few months, we decided to move. It was all just too scary for us to stay in that area. We moved to a house several miles away. We were never bothered again, but I do still think about it. This happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck still stand up sometimes to this day. I just wish that we never experienced something like that again. In April of last year, my boyfriend and I were walking home from our friend's house, and I had just finished my first year at college and we wanted to go out and celebrate and have some fun. We live in a rural town and our friend lived on the far side of it so our walk was about a half an hour or so. I had a drink or two and smoked some of the joint they had rolled. Smoking makes me paranoid and this night was no different. Anyway, we left at maybe 10 or 11 p.m. and everything was perfectly normal until we got to the end of the long street that would eventually lead to my house. This street always feels so long to walk on, like hours can pass and you can barely make a dent in the amount of steps made. The street we turned onto this road was maybe 10 blocks from my house. A few minutes after we turned onto this road, I felt like something was off, but my boyfriend said that I was stoned and reassured me that it was just that. This white pickup truck that was parked in front of some house turns on and begins to drive slowly away and would then park. I watched it to see if it was just me being paranoid or not, but it proceeded to stop a couple houses down and sat there with the car still on. As soon as we get close, it would drive away, parking a little further away. This continued on until we got to the end of my street. At this point, I kept telling my boyfriend that I'm not paranoid and that this truck was screaming with us and he had gone quiet. A couple of houses down from mine, this truck drives to the end of the street, my house on the corner. There's a dead end by my house because we live near a river. It stops for a moment at the dead end and proceeds to turn on their high beams and begin to slowly drive towards us. My boyfriend takes his arm out in front of me, stopping me from walking any further as this truck continues to approach. My house is so close, yet so far. This truck slowly drives by us. The windows are tinted but we can see two silhouettes. And because they had blinded us, we didn't think to look at the license plates or even the model of the truck. My boyfriend, being pretty quick on his feet, waited until the truck disappeared from sight and took my hand before racing to my house and locking the door. He had thought about turning down one of the other streets so we could try to lose them, but he figured he'd wait until they were out of sight to book it to my house so they wouldn't see which house we went in. We looked out one of the front windows very carefully and saw this truck come back into view and began to drive around the block. I'm assuming looking for us. This went on for about 10 minutes. I called the police to inform them that we had been followed, but without the license plates or model, they could only keep their eyes open for suspicious white trucks. I was adamant that these people had to know one of us, if not me, because they drove until they were beside my house. Whether they actually knew it was my house or not, I don't know. My boyfriend tries to insist that it was probably a bunch of kids trying to mess with us, but I don't believe that. A few days later, we heard that someone was picked up and was last seen in a white truck. Since this night, there have been stories in the paper and online that people have been grabbing people and these people were trafficked in the area. I'm still seeing reports even today. So when I was about 15 or so, I would always go grocery shopping with my mom. This time she didn't just need groceries, but some other things that weren't close by. We lived out in the country and the closest town didn't have what she needed, so we went to the bigger town slash city about an hour away. Our last stop was the grocery store, as my mom didn't want to leave a bunch of groceries in the car on a hot summer day while she got whatever else she needed. While we were there, I noticed an older man, tall, skinny, semi-ill looking, that was paying a lot of attention to us. I also caught him talking to himself a lot. I almost ran into him when we were switching aisles and I said sorry, and since then I had seen him like 5 times and every time I felt a shudder and I looked around and he would be somewhere staring at me. I told my mom and she said we were almost done. A few minutes later, we got distracted talking about ice cream. I was telling her about this ice cream brand that my brother, who's a health nut, told me about, and that it was supposed to be a lot better for you than well-known name brands. We started searching for it. I was on one end of the aisle, and she was on the other. I ended up finding it. I reached into the freezer to grab it. When I turned around, the old man was right behind me, like way too close. He said something like, You're too pretty to be eating that. It'll rot your teeth. 
and I freaked out. I pushed past him and ran back to my mom and said, found it, let's go. And she saw the look on my face and looked past me and saw the man. We headed quickly for the registers, and unfortunately we had a lot of groceries and the old man got in the line next to us and only had a few things. He kept talking to himself. I was keeping a very close eye on him and was relieved when he exited the store, but unfortunately that wasn't the end of it. When we left the store I noticed him sitting in his car outside the doors. He sat there and watched us put the groceries in the car and got behind us as we went to go leave the parking lot. I was freaking out. My mom told me it would be okay and that she was right there with me. We ended up taking some back roads home. My mom thought maybe he would get lost. As I said we were about an hour away from home and the back roads made it even longer. We were about 5-10 to 10 minutes away from home and he was still following us. When I asked my mom if I should call the cops, she said no, call your dad and tell him what's going on. Tell him to be waiting outside with the shotgun. So I called my dad and told him what was happening, and he had an idea. Since we lived way out in the country, my parents' neighbor was about half a mile down the road from us. They had a long driveway that you can't see their house from the road. He told me to have my mom go there instead so that the guy wouldn't know where we lived. My dad got there first, told the neighbor what was going on, and they both grabbed their shotguns and waited outside for us to pull up. The guy followed us down the long dirt driveway and as soon as he got to the clearing with the house and saw my dad and our neighbor with their guns out, he threw his car into reverse and hightailed it out of there. So far since that incident, my family nor I have seen that man again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened a few years ago, in my old one person flat. I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right for a few days. Like I was sure that food in the fridge was less than I put back the last time, I found pills for my couch on the floor, stuff like that. I lived alone back then, so there wasn't anyone else with access to my flat, or so I thought. Well, one night I woke up around 1 in the morning sweating from a nightmare. Since I was drenched in sweat, I decided to take a shower. So I put my phone up in the bathroom for music, turned on the water, and enjoyed my shower. A few minutes in, I heard the door move. I never close it, but it still never moves. I took a look at the shower curtain and saw a shadow against it, and a look at my phone confirmed someone was there, since I could clearly see a reflection on my screen that showed someone was standing next to the shower curtain. It took me a lot not to scream and to keep acting like I didn't notice anything, while silently taking the shower head off the holding and turning the water all the way to hot. Our water got really hot when you cranked it all the way to hot, and a few seconds later steam was raising and the water hurt my feet flowing to the drain. I turned around, ripped the shower curtain open, and held the shower head right at the person behind. It was a woman and she screamed in pain. I whacked her in the face with the shower head and jumped out the shower and ran to the door, taking the key out of the lock and locking it closed behind me. A little later she started to bang on the door, but the door didn't give. I called the cops and went to the kitchen to get my big kitchen knife, just for safety. I felt like my throat was closing up when I saw it missing and realized there was only one place where it could possibly be right now. The police came and arrested the woman, who turned out to have been the former person living in the flat and was evicted after not paying rent. Seems she made a copy of the key and came into the flat when I was at work and sometimes at night. I just hope that I never have to experience that again. This happened 5 years ago. I was 25 and used to live alone in a small flat in England, about an hour south of London. It was a medium sized town well known for being a good place to live, with excellent schools, low crime rates, and minimal unemployment. The kind of place where people didn't panic if they left their front door unlocked when they left for work. My flat was on the first floor above pavement level, midway down a hill. There was nobody underneath me, my flat was a kind of bridge with a footpath below it and my kitchen window was directly over a pavement on a fairly busy road. The flat had a small galley kitchen, a living room, and an upstairs bedroom. There was nobody beneath or above my flat, and because of the hill, my kitchen window was literally face on with the pavement and where people walked. There was a printing company opposite that went out of business and then just grass. I always used to close the blinds once the sun had gone down, but liked having the kitchen window open during the afternoons. It had a safety latch so it didn't open far enough for anybody to reach in and I was not on the ground floor, so I didn't worry too much. One day, I got home from work early, about 5.30, and as it was summer I had the kitchen window open and the blinds open. I'm chopping garlic for my dinner, glance up and see an older man literally stood on the pavement watching me, only a few feet away. I glare back as if to say go away and decide to walk out the kitchen into the living room as if I'm talking to someone. I walk back into the kitchen, glance at the window and the man is still there watching me with a small smile on his face. At this point I am slightly panicked. I am alone, nobody's around as I have no direct neighbors. I go into the living room and sit against the wall, clutching my phone. I didn't want him to be able to see me at all. A lot of front doors in England have a kind of two door system, directly on the street you have a glass door. 
normally with decorations on them so you can't see everything in and out, just blurred images, and a proper wooden door inside. I had been out for a smoke so the glass door was shut and locked but the wooden door was wide open. From where I'm sitting, I can see the glass door and I see a figure walking towards it. Sure enough, as it gets closer, I can see that it's the man from the pavement, standing at my front door and trying to look in. He tries opening the door, but luckily, I locked the outside door after my smoke, and it was a strong door. He drops a cigarette, says, screw it, and after about 15 to 20 seconds, he turns around and walks away. I run to shut and lock the wooden door and go to the kitchen window as he walks away and down the road. Just before he turns the corner, turns around and smiles at me, making eye contact. A few days later, it was on the local news that a man matching his description chased down a group of young women in my neighborhood. This happened almost two years ago. I had decided to go hiking with my son who was 8 months old at the time and with my dog named Henry who was an Irish wolfhound and Rottweiler mix. My husband was going fishing with a mutual friend at a state park nearby. I decided to go hike one of the more remote trails in a different part of the park and then meet them later. I drove to a wooded trail about 10 minutes from where my husband was fishing. It was an early spring day, still chilly but tolerable with the sun shining. I parked the car and got my son ready. He was smiling and laughing. I would wear him in a forward-facing hiking sling in the front of me at the time. Henry was excited. We started off on the hike and it was a really beautiful, peaceful trail. Towering trees mixed with pine. A crystal clear creek wove its way through the trail at points. We would periodically stop and all three of us would play. About an hour and a half into the hike, we had gone about three miles and rounded a narrow bend in the trail when we nearly collided with a gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s. Henry was snarling and lunging for the man, before I even completely registered what was going on. I quickly backed up and pulled Henry back the best I could. My bumps were goosed at this point. Henry would not calm down. This is very unusual behavior for him, but none of he was trying to protect us. Trying to talk over Henry, I loudly said, I'm sorry. Henry is just very protective of my son. If you move off to the side, we can pass you. My son was very quiet during this entire exchange, which I found a bit odd. The guy was staring very intently at my son. He then laughed slightly and said, Oh, he should be. It's a good thing he's with you. Then he motioned to something around his neck and said, I'm just out here taking pictures. It's a hobby of mine. Except he wasn't wearing any kind of camera around his neck or anywhere that I could see. He had a canteen around his neck. I politely asked him again to step aside so that we could pass. At this point, Henry was sitting down but growling still. Henry would not take his eyes off this guy. I have no doubt that Henry would have eviscerated this man if he had tried anything. I am positive this guy felt that. The guy looked at Henry for a few seconds, then at my son again. He took a few steps off trail so there was room to get by and so that Henry couldn't reach him when we went by. As I warily walked by him, he was like 10 feet to my left, he muttered something about how he used to be able to see his kids. I kept looking back as we walked away to make sure he wasn't turning around to walk our way. He did continue to stare after us for several minutes though until I could no longer see him. We kept hiking and eventually came to an opening point where cars would park. There was no one there and luckily I still had cell phone reception. I called my husband. He and his friend came to pick us up right away and they took us back to my car. There was no son of the guy we encountered. We went home after that. Henry has since passed away and I am sad that my son doesn't get to grow up with him. He was really the best dog ever, so thanks Henry for being gentle yet fierce. I hope I never have to see that photographer ever again. This story happened about two years ago when I was 19, and my foster sister, Kira, was 16. It was the summer before I was going to college, and I mostly lived with my mom and Kira except for every other weekend, where I'd stay with my dad. Now, summers where I am can get really hot and humid, so we had a habit of waiting to walk the dogs until 6 or 7 p.m because that's when it'd be cooler but still light outside. On this particular evening, mom wasn't going to be home until late, so it was up to me and Kira to walk the dogs by ourselves, unless we wanted our younger dog, Samson, to throw tantrums due to pent up energy. Even though we lived in the countryside and could have walked them down our street, Kira and I decided to drive out 20 minutes to a park instead. At around 7.30 p.m., Kira and I harnessed our two dogs, packed them up in the car, and drove them to the park. Let me quickly explain the layout of the park so that's easier to understand why we get nervous halfway through our walk. This park isn't very big, but it's popular because of its loop. The entire park is surrounded by a mile long looping road with its attractions, like playgrounds, ponds, and a small country hall, spaced about in the inner side of the loop. The outer side is just grass, trees, and one playground at its end. Thus, it's common and expected to pass people walking the loop at least two times if you're walking in opposite directions but not if you're walking in the same direction. Any cars on this road can only drive in one direction because it's a one-way road. 
At first, everything about this walk was normal. I parked the car, we clipped our dogs to leashes, and we started on the loop. Every so often, we'd stop so I could take pictures of our good boys, particularly of Kira trying to wrangle Samson, who pulls like his life depends on it and weaves around because he wants to smell everything. It was while I was taking one of these pictures that the first encounter happened. A man, who looked to be in his 40s, walked past us, walking the same direction we were, up towards the playground on the outer side of the loop. He smiled at Kira, nodded, and said, Hello, you have cute dogs, and kept walking. I honestly didn't think anything of it. We're at a park at a time of day where it's common to walk around due to the cooler temperature and people where I'm at are generally friendly. We smiled back and said hi and thanks, and that was that, or so we thought. This man passed us again only 10 minutes later, directly across from where we'd seen him previously. Just like he did before, he smiled and said hi. This time, Kira and I looked at each other once he was ahead of us and shared the, well, that was weird expression. Just 10 minutes earlier, he had passed us walking up towards the playground and subsequently broke off from the loop and he'd been walking in the same direction as us. This time though, he cut in front of us and he did it in a way where we had to stop to avoid running into him. He nearly touched Kira with how close he was walking. That was already weird in and of itself. The other weird part was him cutting past us in the opposite direction. It came off almost like he wanted to walk by us again, but just like before, Kira and I brushed this weirdness off. The guy could have been enjoying a rambling stroll and doing his own thing for all we knew. Not even 5 minutes later, the same man passed us again, once again cutting so close past us that he nearly brushed shoulders with Kira. Again. This time he walked up behind us, then did this weird directionally slant walk to cross the street and go in the opposite direction, cutting us off again. I told Kira to hustle so we could get to our car and get out instead of doing a second loop. When we were almost to our car, we noticed a car creeping along behind us. We pulled to the side and stopped to let it pass, but for a second it stopped too. We figured whoever was in the car was getting ready to park, so we started walking again. The car started creeping along behind us soon after we did, so we stopped again and the car stopped with us. This was when Kira got nervous. We hadn't seen the middle aged guy since the third cutoff, so we figured I had overthought the whole thing, but here we were with this tinted windowed car acting weird. Was it the same guy back with his car? A different guy? We couldn't tell. Before anything could happen though, another car idled up to the one next to us and whoever it was sped up to the expected 5 miles per hour. We got to our car pretty fast after that and practically picked up the dogs to get them inside of it. We got in and got out of there. My mistake however, was neglecting my rearview mirror and the well advised rule not to drive straight home if you're worried a stranger's taking too much interest in you. We got home at around 8 something. The sun had finally disappeared behind the horizon. Mom wasn't home yet, so we got the dogs some water, locked the doors, ate a late dinner, chilled in the living room, and talked about things that didn't really matter. It was almost 9.30 when the scariest part of this whole ordeal happened. There Kira and I were, sitting on different couches, talking about something, when we noticed the ceiling briefly light up over where Kira was sitting. Due to our long, slightly curvy driveway, it's common to see headlights stream through the window, light up the ceiling, fade, then intensify. It means someone's just come home, so when the ceiling above Kira lit up, we thought nothing of it. Assuming mom was finally coming back from wherever she went that night. Mom has a habit of pulling in then checking her phone for whatever knows how long before coming inside. After a couple of minutes, I noticed the small, motion sensor light mom set up on a table on the porch light up. Right after the light went off, we both heard the storm door open, but we didn't hear anyone pressing the code keys of our lock or jiggling the door handle, like mom usually does right away. The moment the storm door creaked open, our two dogs jumped up and ran to the door, barking like mad. Our golden greyhound mix, Calvin, has a deep and scary bark. Samson, who is a big dog, jumps up on his hind legs and scrabbles to one of the small windows in a desperate attempt to see who's outside. Immediately, the storm door slammed shut, and we heard heavy footsteps on the cement of our porch. Calvin started going nuts and jumped up on Kira's couch, standing on its back instead of the cushions to look out the window. Samson ran out the room and went out the doggy door that leads to the back porch, which is a ramp going down into a fenced off portion of our yard. I sat there, my mind steadily going blank as my heart sped up and my limbs refused to move. Kira gets up and spins around and looks out the window but can't see anything because, besides the motion light on the porch, it's too dark. So naturally, she gets up, grabs a stray dog toy which just so happens to be a tug of war rope with a ball on one end and opens the door. I tell her very calmly to shut the door and stay inside. She ignored me and stepped out onto the porch. She comes back inside after not seeing anything, but to my utter disbelief, she disappears into the kitchen, comes back with a knife, and goes outside again. This time, she's gone for a handful of seconds before running back inside and slamming the door shut. 
Breathless, she tells me she ran out a bit into the yard and saw the outline of a man by the rundown dog kennel we don't use anymore. When she saw him and froze, he moved. This time, she listened to me when I told her to lock the door. I managed to call mom and she convinced me to get up and make sure all the doors were locked, including the basement and making sure the dogs were inside. After mom got home and looked around, finding nothing, we called the non-emergency number for the police, not wanting to bother them in case we were overreacting. Two cops came by and walked around our yard and found nothing. We got the sense they didn't believe us, but instead saw us as two overexcited girls with exaggerated imaginations. Still, they humored us and told us, after we told them about the park, that if we think anyone might be following us, or if someone's acting a little too creepy, not to drive straight home and to check if anyone's following us. Then, they left. But when we heard those footsteps and Kira went outside, she swears she saw someone. The dogs don't run up to the door like that and bark their heads off if no one's there. I don't know if whoever was at our house was the same guy that ran into us at the park. If it was, I don't know the reason why he cut in front of us multiple times. I don't know if he was in the car that inched behind us and stopped when we stopped. I don't know what would have happened if Calvin didn't have a scary and manic bark. I don't know much of anything, but what I do know is, if you're out and about, minding your own business, and a stranger is taking a lot of notice of you, following you, frequently running into you, or whatever, trust your gut. Don't drive or walk straight home, meander, get to a public space, or just take your time. Pay attention to your surroundings. You never know who is watching you. This happened a few years ago when I was an 18 year old girl in high school. I worked at a store in the mall of my mid-sized midwestern city, and that evening, I worked a closing shift. I was walking back to my car in the snowy darkness when a black SUV pulled up beside me. A woman opened the window and yelled, hey, excuse me, I need your help. She was a round-faced woman in her 30s or 40s and spoke with a very heavy Spanish accent. She went into a story about how her sister got into a car accident and the woman needed to get gas in her car before she could help the sister. However, she could not find a gas station and had no money, and she even said she had driven around to several churches to ask for help, but no one would help her. She was difficult to understand and did not tell the story super clearly, but I understood that she needed to find a gas station and she needed me to pay for it. She told the story between sobs and she seemed so desperate that I was moved to help her. I told her that she could follow my car to a gas station that was just across the highway and that I would buy her some gas. At the gas station, I parked in front of the store and was surprised when she did not pull up to a gas pump. As I had expected. I got out of my car and said, okay, don't you want me to buy and pump gas for you? She then said something like I had misunderstood her first story. She didn't need gas. She needed money to give to her sister and added a bunch of other facts I don't remember to continue the story. Her accent and changing story was difficult to understand. I said, well I don't have cash on me, only my card. I mean I suppose I could see if there's an ATM inside? She immediately replied that she knew there was, which definitely is suspicious in hindsight, but I didn't pick up on it at the time. I agreed to go in and get her some money from the ATM, and as I turned to go inside, she said, wait, but if you give me money, I will have to repay you somehow. I said, no, that's okay, you don't have to. She said, no, give me your phone number so I can contact you to meet up later so I can repay you, or give me your address and I will send the money to you. I refused both, and she tried again several more times, begging me to meet up with her later to give me the money. This probably lasted five minutes or so. Finally, as I refused her last time, she said in a very chilling way, don't be so nice. Despite all of this, I for some reason was still convinced she needed my help, and I went into the gas station to use the ATM. However, in my teenage wisdom, I could not remember my PIN number, and was unable to withdraw money. I went back outside to tell the woman, and she rolled her eyes, puffed something under her breath, and very quickly got into her car and sped off. I never saw her again after that. As I drove home, I became suspicious about the scenario. I figured out after a while that the woman was definitely trying to scam me for my money, but it disturbed me more that she tried so hard to get me to meet up with her later and give her contact information. I just hope that I never have to meet someone like that in the future. When I was young, I used to live in rural Pennsylvania. Where I lived wasn't quite suburbs, but the houses were all within walking distance of each other, and we knew nearly all of our neighbors. My small neighborhood was blocked off from the ones on either side by decent sized creeks, and to get to them, you needed to climb down a fairly steep slope. This is an important detail later. My friend Rachel was a bit younger than me, by two or three years. I was 11 at the time. We had decided to go on a bike ride and ended up dropping our bikes and helmets at the top of the hill leading down to one of the creeks and we went exploring. We were making a racket, I'm sure, squealing as we jumped around trying not to get wet. We noticed bubbles in the water and became concerned for the swans that lived down at the other end of the creek in the pond. Out of nowhere we heard a man chuckling and he was standing at the top of the hill above near where we were standing. 
I said nothing. He asked what we were doing and slowly started making his way down the rough terrain of the slope. He obviously didn't know where the path to come down was. Rachel answered him that we were trying to find out where the bubbles were coming from and that she was scared it would hurt the swans, as there had never been any bubbles before today. He told us he could take a water sample and test it if we could bring it up to him, then asked our names and how old we were, still making his way down to us the entire time. Rachel told him her name and had started to say mine when I stopped her by grabbing her shoulder. I had an extremely bad feeling about this man and I was very uncomfortable with the situation. I perked my head up looking off to the side and asked her, Did you hear that, Rachel? I think your mom is calling us. I turned and dragged her up the path across from where the man was climbing down at, and we jumped on our bikes. I noticed this man's car parked next to where we put our bikes. Our helmets were missing. We heard the man scrambling after us, screaming that he hadn't heard anything. We started pedaling back toward my house, as Rachel lived in a different neighborhood, and the man started following us in a car after he finally reached the top. The man was still trying to get us to talk to him, so I turned off into my uncle's yard where I saw my cousin out cutting the lawn and started yelling for him. He was a big dude, 16 or so at the time, and the man in the car burnt rubber speeding off when he saw we were no longer alone. We ended up calling the police and we were not the first girls that had the same issue with the man of that description and that car that day. So whatever that man's intentions were, I'm just glad that Rachel and I didn't have to experience them. This was my very first apartment and I was so excited to be in it. My freshman year I lived in a dorm on campus, and before that I just lived with my mom, so I had never lived on my own before. The apartment was a two bathroom and two bedroom and I shared it with my friend who I had known since we were 13. I had just turned 20 when all this happened. Josh was my friend and it was his first year at the university, so naturally I showed him around. We did pretty much everything together. Fast forward to the homecoming football game. We attend a university that's crazy into football and we're actually a pretty good team, so the homecoming game is a big deal to everyone. Josh was so excited to go out because it was his first homecoming game. He was going to go with this boy he started flirting with and he wanted me to come along. I don't really remember why I didn't want to go, I just didn't. Josh got mad at me, we said dumb stuff to each other and he left, so I was alone for the rest of the night. I had, still do, a small dog, Poppy, who lived with us. She was around a year old at the time. We actually had a pretty relaxing night in the beginning. I took a shower and put on face mask and Poppy and I watched TV in bed and stuff. I remember listening to a song on repeat the entire day because that's what I do when I find a new song that I like. To this day, I still can't listen to it without being reminded. We went to sleep around 10pm I think. I wasn't keeping up with what was going on with the football game, so I really have no idea if it was just ending or whatever, but I knew not to expect Josh home early because he was going out with the guy he was seeing, Dinlan, afterwards. There is a strip of bars along one of the main roads running towards campus, and that's where they would be. That's where everyone would be after the game ended. I don't know what time it was, but I woke to cabinets being slammed and really loud noises. It was really dark in my room and the only thing I could see was that the kitchen lights were on. I saw the light coming through the bottom of the door. It sounded like people were going through our kitchen cabinets one by one. Poppy was at the edge of the bed barking like a crazy dog. I had never seen her act this way. I was struggling to keep myself awake because I'm a really heavy sleeper, not anymore, and I just knew it wasn't Josh or Dylan, but some stupid part of me decided to call out, hello, but it was weak sounding and I really don't know if they heard me or not. Suddenly, my bedroom door opened. I shot up. Poppy was snarling and trying to lunge at the stranger in my bedroom. I couldn't see anything because the light from the open door was kind of blinding. I just saw his figure. He was wearing a hoodie and he stood there for maybe 15 seconds and I was just staring at him. The whole time Poppy was trying to screw him up. He quickly closed my door and I don't know why, I just didn't move. Then my door flings open a second time and we're staring face to face again, for the same painfully long amount of time. My heart was racing and I remember thinking, he's gonna hurt me. Now that I look back, I should have screamed or something. Poppy was at the very edge of the bed now, vicious and snarling. She sounded like a big dog honestly. And then he slammed my door shut. As soon as he did, I jumped out of my bed and locked my door. I heard them take my car keys. I was terrified they would find my car and steal it since I had just parked directly outside. I frantically called 911 and was sobbing the whole time said someone is in my house they came in my room please help and it took them 30 minutes to get there when i know that there were cop cars everywhere surrounding the bars since it was homecoming which i live a five minute drive from when i finally came out the living room and my roommate's bedroom were completely ransacked my roommate's tv was on the floor because they tried to carry it out but i guess decided just to leave it they stole my xboxes and all my games they stole my book bag with my textbooks and my homework in it the two policemen got here and i told them everything and asked if i could call my roommate Josh picked up the phone but was heavily slurring and I could tell that he was inside of a bar and could barely hear me. I just screamed please give Dylan the phone, hoping that Dylan was at least more sober than Josh was, so Josh put Dylan on the phone. And I don't know how, through my tears and sobs and through the screaming people and house music, 
but he heard me say that our apartment was robbed. He frantically said we are coming and hung up. They probably ran. While I was waiting for them, one of the policemen asked if he could try to take prints from my roommate's TV and I agreed. He proceeds to then drop his flashlight directly on the screen, and as it shattered, he just looked at me. So then Josh and Dylan get back and the policemen totally change their tone. They get aggressive and say that they were targeted for a reason. I'm pretty sure that since it was homecoming, the robbers were not expecting me to be there. They were trying to just rob apartments blindly. They also lived on the ground floor so it's easier to get in those than in the two-story and three-story apartments. Josh is in the military, but Josh looks just like any other regular college freshman boy. And his only friends at the time were literally me and Dylan, so we were the only ones who knew he was in the military. They tried to accuse Josh of stashing guns and drugs everywhere and that's why we got robbed. I literally was like, are you kidding me? They then tried to pull me to the side and say that Josh hired people to come rob his own apartment while I was inside. They asked me, how do you know these guys? I said, sir, I have known Josh since we were 13. We moved here together to attend university together. He just gave me a look. When they left, we got our locks immediately changed and then I had to take the next day off of school to drive to the nearest Nissan dealership, 30 minutes away, and then wait 7 hours for them to rewire a key fob for me. To the men who robbed me, and to the cops who accused my roommate of robbing his own apartment, I hope I don't have to meet you again. This happened to me 4 years ago when I was 16 years old on a school trip, but I still remember it to this day. I had recently graduated from one school and enrolled in another, more advanced one via special program. Germany's system of education is sometimes complicated. There were about 20 people who did the same as me and we were all put in one class to catch up with the regular students. To get to know each other better, the class went on a 3 day trip to a youth hostel in our county town. The trip was organized by our school and overall pretty nice. Two of my friends had transferred with me and we had fun, except for the second evening. It was late summer and the sun was still up despite it already being around 7pm. One of my friends, Sarah, and I decided that we wanted to go for a walk before accompanying our other classmates to the river to have some drinks. We wanted to visit the newly built benches along the river and just talk for a bit. To get to those benches, we walked over a long parking lot next to the river. Between the parking lot and the river, there was a small path which was, in some places, divided from the parking lot by a small grass strip with a few bushes and trees. On the other side of the parking lot, there was a bridge approach which could be used by cars and pedestrians alike. This will get relevant later. There were some rocks in the parking lot to prevent cars from driving too far and falling into the river. My friend and I had some fun by jumping from one rock to the other. At some point, a man on a bicycle, probably in his early 20s, emerged next to us on the other side of the parking lot. He applauded us for some weird reason we didn't understand. My friend applauded back ironically and we just continued walking but stopped jumping on the rocks. When we arrived at the benches, we chose the first one we came across and sat down. Bicycle guy stopped right next to us, got off his bike and just lingered. I started to feel uneasy but since there were no free benches left, I thought he just wanted to hang out there too. At some point, he pulled out his cell phone and called someone. Even though he was right next to us the whole time, I couldn't understand him because he was speaking a foreign language. Sarah and I sat there for about 1-2 to two hours until it started getting darker. Bicycle guy was still right next to us and still on the phone, circling the area around us and just generally creeping us out by continuously staring at us. At this point, Sarah had also started feeling uneasy and we shared our feelings about this guy. Since it was almost dark, there was no one around anymore. We wanted to return to the hostel. The second we got up and started walking towards the parking lot, Bicycle guy also got onto his bike. My heart sank into my stomach when I realized he was going the same direction. Just slow enough to stay next to us. He continued following us. When exiting the bench area, Sarah and I took the path next to the river to get to the parking lot. Directly at the beginning of the parking lot, there was one part where the path had one of the strips with trees next to it. Bicycle guy directly went past us and onto the parking lot, passing the trees on the right side. We went to the left. He continued staring at us before he went further ahead. The second Sarah and I set a foot on the path, I stopped her and told her that if he turned around after the trees to get onto our path, which he would have no reason for if he didn't want anything from us, we would turn around and run the opposite direction. Well, bicycle guy turned onto our path. We booked it out of there as fast as we could while desperately clutching each other's hands while bicycle guy was following us. There was not a single person around to help us so running was our only chance. We couldn't process what was happening to us in that moment, but we just knew that we needed to run. Remember the bridge approach I mentioned earlier? We went across the smallest part of the parking lot and went up there so we could take another route back. While walking up the narrow sidewalk, still grabbing each other's hands, we glanced down onto the parking lot. If I hadn't been sure that he was following us, then I definitely was in that moment. Down on the parking lot there was Bicycle Guy, circling the area and staring us down while we were almost running up the bridge. It got even worse. We were halfway up when suddenly, Another guy on a bicycle passed us and stopped a few meters in front of us. 
he started talking to Bicycle Guy who had been following us and then also stared at us. Bicycle Guy had basically called another friend over for whatever he was trying to do. Sarah and I immediately changed to the other side of the bridge approach and took the stairs down there. We chose to take a route where we wouldn't be alone on the streets. I was shaking the whole walk back. I am incredibly thankful for my gut feeling. To this day, I still think about this encounter when I'm walking somewhere alone in the evening or night. I don't think I'll be able to forget this anytime soon. For background, my family moved to the countryside from the city when I was about 7 years old, and I'm 21 now. Both my parents had grown up in the suburbs, and I lived in the capital of our state for about 10 years before we moved. It definitely took us some time to get used to the train tracks that ran by our house, the wild animals, the weird but kind neighbors, and the odd visitors. Another thing is that if you get off the main road and turn onto a long gravel drive to get up to our house, we can see the entire length of the driveway from certain points in our yard, which is about 3 acres. A few years after we moved in, my dad got a promotion at work, and as a result, started to go to conferences and business trips that lasted from a few days to a week, at least a couple times a year. My mom felt nervous about being home alone with two young kids. I was 10 and my brother was 6, and so we decided to get a dog. We knew we wanted a big dog, but something that would be gentle with my brother and I. After a few weeks looking at shelters, we took home Rocky. He was 9 months when we took him home, and already pushing 70 pounds. We believe he's a German Shepherd mixed with some northern or mountain breed. We aren't sure to this day, but he's a massive red colored dog with a long black muzzle and ears, and a fluffy tail that he carries over his back, and a white stripe up his nose. It wasn't long until he was 100 pounds, and an absolute force to be reckoned with. Even though he was very gentle with both my brother and I, loved our cats, it was a big ball of joy around anyone we brought into our house, he tended to be very territorial and aggressive with other dogs, and very protective of us, especially of my mom and I. Once, the electric company came to do work on the telephone poles on our property, without telling us first, and after 20 minutes they finally had to call us because Rocky had them trapped in their truck, and was jumping up and barking at their windows. I doubt he would really have attacked them if they'd gotten out of their trucks, but it was more than enough to make them think twice. This protective instinct came in very, very handy one day. It was summertime, my dad was at work, and my mom was home with my brother and I, since she was a teacher and off for the summer with us. My mom was working in our garden, and my brother and I were playing close by, with Rocky watching over all of us. Rocky all of a sudden sounded the alarm, throwing his head up in the air and barking and hallowing. He makes a deep woo-woo noise. I looked up to see a dirty white pickup truck pull off from the main road and into our driveway. This wasn't necessarily alarming at first, as people sometimes used our driveway to turn around when they got lost. But the white pickup truck slowly ambled up our drive, and I could see something strange in the bed. It was lumpy and discolored, but I couldn't really tell what it was until he pulled all the way up to our house, where our other cars were, and honked the horn to get our attention. It was meat. Giant, red chunks of meat with some of the limbs of various animals still attached. It was the creepiest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Just a weird man who looked to be in his early 50s, driving a pickup truck full of meat in the southern July heat. I immediately just got a really, really bad vibe from the guy. And I remember my mom telling my brother and I to go inside, and we did, but watched out the glass door. Rocky had surprisingly been quiet at that point, but was now next to my mom, and she had her hand around his collar. The guy rolled down his window and asked my mom if she wanted to purchase some meat. My mom said no and to please leave our property. Instead, he went on about the different types of meat and asking how much we wanted, beef, venison, pork, etc. My mom asked him to leave again, but instead, he decided to get out of the nasty white pickup. As soon as his feet were on the ground, Rocky went ballistic, barking and snarling. This finally made the guy stop. He looked at Rocky, looked at my mom, and asked, Does your dog bite? And my mom, deathly serious, replied, Only if I tell him to. The guy took one more look at Rocky, and I'm guessing he decided not to mess with the giant, snarling beast. He got back in his truck, backed up, and headed back down our driveway. I don't know if he was really selling the meat or not, but apparently he'd been around to our neighbors, who also had gotten a really bad vibe from him. We'll never know what he was really up to with his giant slabs of meat in the bed of his pickup truck. Maybe he was just a weird guy trying to sell some sketchy meat. Maybe he was looking for something else. We never saw that guy again. Rocky's still kicking it, by the way. He's almost 15 and completely deaf, but he's still out in the yard on summer days, watching over us. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago, by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7,000 feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up slash make dinner, etc. But I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up this steep tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. 
Now the day before I had found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago. And I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement, before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So while still concerned, I started hiking up the steep hill to hand the bag. It was so steep I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down, before making another 5-6 to six step push to the next tree I could just lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making up this hill ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance, and I get about 100 feet up the hill, and I hear a whole lot of big movement at about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage, slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest, and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in the matter of seconds, because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die. And I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12-15 foot cliff onto the boulders below, like hundreds of 5-20 to 20 foot boulders. So I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. Then I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which is just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent, so she didn't wander off like I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after I kind of snap back to it, I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order. I call my dog back to me. He comes and sits against my feet as my back is against a tree, so I'm kind of pinned slash stuck there for a moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there so I let him lean against me while I try to collect myself. This is when I realized I'd completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast up to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline dumps going right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the eyes of whatever is up there. Peering and peering, nothing. But I just heard but I had just heard something, we both did, and whatever it was didn't get away, or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there, so I'm kinda just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, and at one point my dog lunges forward, unpinning me. He does a fake slash bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this I finally see movement, something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon slash sunset. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I make out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes but some raggedy stuff with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly, actually almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes and his face was covered in dirt or something, but I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment, so I stare for what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared. And I also had to get off that hill before total dark, or I could be seriously hurt slash risk dying trying to get back down. So carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up, and look in that direction again, just to make it even more clear I saw him, and eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark back, or at my dog, but when I get there, my little dog had semi got out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling, with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought okay maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out, but I was positive I had zipped it so the zipper tap such openings was at the very top of the tent door, out of reach. So in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my pistol. I fired a single shot into the air as the sun was setting, climbed into my tent without eating, and lay with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up I was packing up my stuff and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucks. It was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I had made it to the last camp, about 4 miles from my vehicle, but thankfully there were other people there. We sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They started to tell me they are planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning, so I tell them my story in detail. 
Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on, other people had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and a woman found murdered last year. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005 when I was about 13 years old. It took place in a rural area, a good ways outside the town of Uvalde, Texas. The town itself was really small back then and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about 1,000 acres, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about 7 hours on my dad's hard top Jeep Wrangler. That car was so uncomfy, I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone else lease it that year yet and the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life I had been in scouts for a couple years and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land we settled in, the cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out, then setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7am. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they had been rooting so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there. Not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, hey, we're hunters, this is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. The weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and it looked like to be ski pants. Now this is Texas in the summer, it was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again, no reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnap the clip to his pistol holster. We approached the person's right side and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man all the while talking to him asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man and my dad stood straight up with a confused look on his face. I called out and said what's wrong and he called back saying it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring and as I got closer one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new, no dust, sap, bird droppings, or signs of being outside for more than any more than a day at most. At that moment I looked at my dad and could see him get worried, almost immediately after I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched and I knew my dad felt it too. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified so it felt like an eternity, but in reality it was only about 45 minutes. After returning we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out the next week when he was in the area. He also said that he never had an issue with people because his property was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home, we talked and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping too. Turns out that next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found any trace of anyone, no mannequin or anything. That story still makes my hair stand on end. I honestly have no idea what that mannequin was. So this happened to me a couple of years ago when my now husband and I were living in a townhouse in a pretty decent area. 
My husband was working third shift as a corrections officer at our local corrections facility and I was working as a waitress slash bartender. It was an unusually warm night for mid-March so I took advantage and decided to take my husband's 80 pound Alaskan Malamute Siberian Husky mixed dog on a quick walk around the neighborhood near our complex. We get to the end of the street that leads into the complex we live in and across the street is a marathon gas station. I notice as the dog, Luke, stops to relieve himself that there's a guy across the street at the gas station with a case of beer in his hands. I have my phone out texting a friend and looked back up to notice the guy was near the stop sign, also relieving himself on the sign. I felt really awkward and instantly put my phone away and led Luke down the street on our path. At this point I think this guy noticed us and he crossed the street to where Luke and I had just been. I hear him walking a few feet behind me and just keep my head down staring at my phone with Luke glued to my hip. After about 10 seconds, I hear this guy's steps getting closer. Luke realizes there is someone behind us and he stops in his tracks. Mind you, he's a big dog compared to my 5'2 self, but I can handle him pretty easily and he's a very well trained dog by my husband. But I noticed his ears were perked up and his tail was straight up. I was glad that he was aware of our surroundings, but I still wanted to keep moving and away from this guy. This guy finally catches up so I tighten my grip on Luke's leash and pull him closer to me and step into the grass to allow this guy to pass us and keep Luke out of his way. Does this guy keep going on and pass? Nope. When I thought he was about to pass us, I stuttered out a small apology because Luke was pulling on his leash a little to investigate this guy and most people did get intimidated by him just by his size. The guy stops and just stares at me for a minute. Long enough for me to smell the cigarettes and booze rolling off of him and to notice he is probably in his mid to late 20s, dark hair, scruffy looking, and just dirty. He smiles and then finally seems to notice Luke trying to get at him and asks, Cute dog, what's his name? Instead of making up a name, I just say Luke. He then proceeds to ask me if he can pet my dog and before I can even give him an answer, he leans down to start petting Luke's head. Luke did not like that. Luke jumped at him as a warning and the guy backed up chuckling. I apologized and mentioned that he was very protective and made up a lie that he was trained as my dad's former K9 unit. My dad is a software developer. Instantly, I saw this guy's face change. He asked me what my name was and I gave him a fake name. He then asked me if I lived around here and I said I was visiting a friend of mine for the weekend. He then made a sudden step towards me and I'm not lying when I say I have never heard my husband's dog growl in the five years I have been with him. But the sound that came from my dog sounded like something coming from nightmares. Luke's hair was spiking on his spine and he was throwing himself up on his back legs and kicking his from legs at this guy. He had put himself completely between myself and the guy and snapping at him. This freaked the dude out so much he stumbled backward nearly dropping his beard. He quickly said, we'll have a nice night cutie, and stumbled off down the road. When I say my heart was pounding, it was deafening. I grabbed Luke's leash so hard and sprinted between the buildings until I got back to my townhouse and locked all the doors and collapsed by the front door. Luke was in my face the whole time kissing me and whining. This dog is the sweetest and most gentle creature I have ever met and hearing him growl and seeing him react the way he did made me realize that I needed to get out of the situation and fast. Often, I enjoy walking my dog at nighttime. This is due to the fact that my dog is harder to walk when people are around with their own dogs. So, we tend to walk around parks in the area when they've been become somewhat secluded. My 120 pound black boxer slash lab named Loki could be somewhat considered threatening to most from what I hear. I figured his size would be used as a deterrent for anyone looking to cause nightly troubles. I was dead wrong. On one specific night in the fall of 2016, I could recall of an encounter that reminds me of why I am so reluctant to walk around once daylight falls. This specific park is one I have been to a couple times and from what I remember, this park is usually secluded around 6.30 and later. Aside from a couple of joggers or very few other dog walkers, not many people walk the same path I take. I also like to put on my headphones and listen to music while I walk. But on the specific night, I chose not to wear them since my phone was on low battery and I wanted to preserve it as long as I could. Anyway, the walk was going as usual. Loki did his business and we continued on our usual path. About midway on our walk, I realized that it had started to get really dark. Since he was done with his business, I decided to cut the walk somewhat short and we took a shortcut that kind of led us off the path. This path had a bunch of trees surrounding the area and there were still leaves in the branch. With that being said, I felt a weird feeling as if I was being watched. I could not for the life of me shake off the feeling of being watched. I peered back to see if anyone had been following me out of anxiety and every time I did, no one was there. In fact, no one was anywhere. This whole shortcut was essentially secluded. Suddenly, Loki stopped walking and also looked back. I told him, Loki, come on boy, we've gotta go. One thing I failed to mention was that Loki is a big coward. I noticed his tail was tucked between his legs, which is a telltale sign that a dog is afraid. I was also curious and a bit nervous but I surely did not want to find out what he heard or noticed. 
I just wanted to get out as soon as possible. I pulled a little and he began to walk, but every now and then I'd see him peer back. After maybe a minute or so of him walking, he stopped again and this time he began to growl. Despite being a coward, Loki is a bark but no bite kind of dog, so I took this chance to see exactly what he was growling at. It was quite dark, so I could not see well. So I used my phone's flashlight to see what was up. Trees, just trees. What he heard was probably some kind of small animal. Once again, I turned around and kept walking. He continued to peer back once in a while still, but this time I noticed it was a lot more frequent. I just said to myself, just squirrels, maybe a bird, and I ignored it. Then, I heard what appeared to be actual footsteps and branches breaking. There is absolutely no way a small animal could have produced a sound like that. Look, he turned around quick and still with his tail tucked, he began to growl and bark at a figure that I could only describe as a man in his early 50s, possibly late 40s, appear from out the woods. He was dressed in dirty clothing, his hair was long and was graying. He had one hand in his pocket and he said to me, Nice dog you have there, kid. What breed is he? He's a boxer slash lab, I replied. Oh, I love dogs. Mind if I pet him? He wondered. The man got closer and emerged from the trees. As he got closer, I realized that he was quite tall. Loki instantly got bad vibes. He ran behind me and started to bark at him. Actually, I do kind of mind. My dog here doesn't like strangers. Sorry, but it's probably not best if you pet him. I quickly stated. It's okay, really. He seems like a friendly guy. Just a little pet wouldn't harm him. The man retorted as he got closer. I felt extremely uncomfortable as he appeared to get closer and closer. I don't know why this guy couldn't take no for an answer. I'm really sorry man, I'm scared he'd bite you or something, I told him as I began to walk away. I don't know why you just won't let me introduce myself to him, the guy replied angrily. This time I began to speed walk. I was very uncomfortable and my fight or flight instincts began to take over. He followed us and kept muttering curses to himself. I don't know if this man was under the influence of something, but he did not let up. I won't lie, I started to get a little angry. Why can't I guy just take no for an answer? He began to match my speed, almost as if he was trying to catch up to us. Loki and I both took this as an answer to start sprinting a bit. I don't remember much of the running, it was all a blur to me, but I do remember the spine-tingling feeling of hearing his footsteps rapidly increasing behind me. For a man of his stature, he was quite fast. I also realized that his intentions may have not been just to pet my dog. No one reasonable would go that far just to pet a dog that clearly wanted nothing to do with him. I looked behind me and he was in pursuit. Maybe about 10 feet behind me he was chasing us. Finally, the path led to the park exit and into the busier streets. I lived about 10 minutes away from the park. I made sure no one was following me and I even made sure to walk on the populated streets. After what seemed like an eternity, we got home but I knew for a fact that I was not going to get any sleep. From my window in the porch, I watched all night with Loki, just to see if anyone had followed us home. I also made a police report with my parents. After all, this guy seemed to have been quite suspicious and who knows what his true intentions were. Ever since, I haven't walked Loki in that park. I've also made it a habit of mine to walk on livelier streets at night. If I could give anyone one piece of advice, even if you live in a relatively safe town, do not ever let your guard down. This happened about a year ago to me and my husband. It was our 10th anniversary, so we decided to go camping, just the two of us, and of course our dog. There is a big national park slash camping area near where we live, little less than an hour drive, so that was where we were heading. It's basically a big forest with many small lakes, ponds, trails, and camping sites around. Pretty popular place during summer, but we still saw some people, even though it was late September and the weather was cold. We found a good spot next to a lake to set up our camp. It was a beautiful day, so we wanted to hike a bit in the forest. There was a nice long path that was going around the lake where we had our camp, so we chose to go that way. The lake was quite small, and there was another camping site by it. You could see there from our camp, and from there you could see our camp. They were almost on opposite sides of the lake. We walked past another camp, and saw a man there alone just standing and staring at us, not answering when we greeted him. He was maybe in his late 20s, around the same age as us. I thought at that point that maybe he was just shy and a little weird. He had a small tent set up and some other stuff all around the place, so I figured he had been there for a while. We just continued walking and didn't think much to it. Eventually we got to our camp and started to set up our tent before it's too dark. We made some food by the fire and just sat there enjoying the peace. Suddenly, our dog starts barking like crazy. She was tied to a long wire around a tree. We immediately realized that she wasn't just paranoid and that there was something really in the woods and it was near. It had been very dark for hours at this point. I took the dog to a leash and my husband started to look around with his bright headlamp. Our dog just kept barking. We were confused and sure it was some kind of animal, maybe a bear or a moose, but we couldn't understand why it wasn't scared of us and why it wouldn't run away. My husband went ahead to the path that leads to the other camp. Right when he got to the path, which was just less than 10 meters away from our camp, he saw something on the ground. I told him to go check it out and followed with our dog. 
He stopped, turned at me and said, it's a human, laying on the ground. The first thing I thought was that maybe they were hurt or dead or something. They just laid there not moving, facing the ground. We asked, are you okay? Are you hurt? And they just suddenly stood up. Turned out, it was the guy from the other camp. He was very scared of our dog and told me to not let her near him. I was kind of relieved that it wasn't some bear that was going to eat us, but I soon learned that a bear might have been less scarier than this guy. After he stood up, he walked straight to our campfire and sat down. My husband tried to ask him multiple times why he was sneaking in the dark forest without any light. He didn't give us an answer. We even laughed a bit and told him how we thought that he was a bear or something. But he didn't even smile, just stared at the fire, looking annoyed. His right leg was soaking wet. He probably stepped off the path and dipped it in the lake on his way to our camp. He sat with us for 30 minutes, not talking much. He also clearly wanted to know where our dog was at all times. I saw he had a knife hanging from his belt, but I guess it's not that weird when you're in the woods. Every few minutes he put his hand in his pocket and just peeked at whatever was in there. Kind of like checking the time on your phone without taking it out from your pocket, but it wasn't a phone he had there. I felt very uncomfortable and anxious by the whole situation. So, when the 30 minutes had passed, he again stood up and mumbled about going back to his own camp and left. He never gave us any explanation of why he came to our camp or why he was stalking us in the dark. He tried very hard not to be seen when we found him. When I thought he was far enough, I told my husband that there's no way I'm sleeping in that tent. The biggest nope ever. Fortunately for me, he agreed and said that that guy might come back when we are sleeping. I just wanted to leave as soon as possible, so my husband started packing up things up. Our car is nearby, thank goodness, and I was guarding and looking around with the light if he comes back. Just when we had almost all of our stuff in the car, I saw a quick flash of light on the path from the guy's camp towards ours. He was coming back. Maybe he thought we went to sleep because he couldn't see our campfire anymore. So yeah, we got in the car and left real quick. I don't know if we overreacted, but I had such a bad feeling about him. Who crawls in the dark, wet forest alone just to stalk some strangers? What would have he done if our dog wouldn't have hurt him? What were his motives? I don't know and didn't want to stay there and find out. I'm just glad that we had our dog with us. There's a chance that she saved our lives. This happened to me when I was 19 and in college. I met a guy named Sam through a friend of a friend. Sam seemed nice enough and I would see him around but that's as far as it went. One day we managed to end up alone as I'm coming out of my building, he sees me and starts chatting me up. At first it was simple small talk, but I became uncomfortable once he starts complimenting me saying I have nice teeth. Not nice smile, but nice teeth. I thought this was a weird way to phrase a compliment, but I just ignore it. He then goes on to ask me, what are you? Meaning he wants to know my ethnicity. I tell him I am Latina. He asks if I speak Spanish and I say yes. He makes a comment saying he likes Shakira's music and that he likes her song La Tortua. He then asked me what La Tortura means. I tell him it translates to the torture. I notice his eyes get wide and he starts smiling. At this point I'm done talking to him and I tell him I have to go. I make a mental note to stay away from him after that because throughout the rest of the conversation he had a really creepy smile on his face. I get busy with classes so I forget about him quickly. One day I get a call on my cell phone from an unknown number. I decide to answer it and I hear a raspy male voice breathe heavily and say La Tortura. I hang up and think what was that, but I just take it as a stupid prank and move on with my day. For the next week or two, I keep getting calls from an unknown number, but I don't answer. Weeks go by. I have forgotten about the phone calls when I end up running into Sam again outside my building. He starts making small talk again then with a giant grin he says, Have you been getting any phone calls lately? It takes me a second to realize that it's been him calling me from that unknown number. I don't want him to see me reacting so I say no, but internally I'm freaking out. He then goes on to tell me, I've been watching you through your window for weeks and you never noticed. For context, my dorm room window was split into three parts. One big glass pane in the middle, but two smaller panes on either side that you could open for fresh air. If those side panels were open enough, you had enough room to slip your hand in, move the curtain out the way, and get a good look inside. Obviously after that I was thoroughly creeped out and was wondering how many times he watched me dress, nap, or do any of the other things you do in the comfort of your own space. I ended the conversation somehow and wondered what I should do. After I calmed down, I decided to report what he said to me to my residential advisor and then reported it to the director of housing at our school. Luckily, the director took the situation seriously and encouraged me to report him to campus police. A report was made, they would have to speak to him to get his response to my allegations and I was told that in the meantime, if he approaches me again, I should come back and make another report. 
A couple of days later, the director of housing comes to my dorm to tell me that campus police spoke to Sam and he admitted to them that he told me he had been watching me but that it was all a joke. He was told to stay away from me and I was told to report him again if he kept harassing me but it never went further than that. Over the next few days, I end up telling the girls in my dorm what happened with Sam. They obviously think it's gross so we make plans to go out on campus as a group for the time being and to keep our curtains closed. Going out as a group definitely made me feel safer and everything was fine for a little while until, one day, we are coming out of the dorm dining hall and we run into Sam and some of his friends. He sees me, gets visibly upset, and starts approaching me yelling, why did you tell him what I said? I got scared thinking he might do something, but luckily my dorm mates rallied around me and rushed me out of there. I knew he was mad about reporting him because before this happened our mutual friend, a male, had told me he's mad that you reported him. Thankfully, this is the last time I was ever near that guy. The school year ended soon after this happened. I moved off campus, got a new friend group, and moved on. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't made a report and ignored him. When I was 16, I used to attend English classes that were for people of all ages. So I was used to having colleagues older than me that also wanted to improve their language skills. I was really close to another girl my age back then, Jasmine. She was much more popular than me, so she would always introduce me to new people. One day I noticed this guy in her group. He was 32 and very talkative, always smiling. For some reason though, he made me feel uncomfortable from the get-go. I think it's because he would stare at me for no apparent reason. While everyone was talking as a group, he seemed to address me specifically every time, but I didn't give him much thought. As the days passed, he started waiting around before my classroom door and started conversations about my friendship with Jasmine, my high school, my family, etc. I thought it was weird that he was so interested, given that he was much older, but I felt guilty for feeling bad. Like he was just being nice and I was being mean to think he was weird. I should have listened to my instinct. Instead, I forced myself to answer, to make small talk. He told me how close he was with Jasmine and that made me feel a bit safer. When I asked her about him though, she said she didn't know him that well, but that he seemed nice enough. One day I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. When I picked it up, it was him. He said he got my number from Jasmine. I was upset and confronted her about giving my number to him and she said he insisted so she ended up agreeing to it. He started calling me all the time, like two to three times a day, to ask about my day, say he missed me and wanted to chat. He started telling me private stuff about his life because he felt like he could talk to me since I was so mature for my age. I didn't like it so I stopped answering, or would make an excuse and quickly hang up. And he would send me messages. That's when things started getting worse. The messages would vary in tone, sometimes they were really childish, with lots of emojis. He would wish me a lovely day or say he was thinking of me. Other times they would simply say, you're so pretty, too pretty, with no context. He would say he was glad I didn't have a boyfriend, that I should never get one or he would be mad. I never answered to those and showed them to Jasmine. I told her I didn't want to see or talk to him anymore before or after class and she said she would help. I started going to class late so I wouldn't meet him in the corridors. I leave class immediately after the end, but I saw him watching me. I could feel he knew what I was doing but actually sort of enjoyed it. I felt like it was a game to him, making me feel uncomfortable. He stopped talking to Jasmine and everyone else, but continued to message me saying, I miss you or why are you so busy? I blocked his number. I thought that would be the end of it and started relaxing a bit, but one day I was talking to another girl outside the school and he showed up with a big smile and said that it's been too long and why I wasn't answering his messages. He acted like he was worried about me, that I was studying too much, etc. He invited me to go have a coffee with him in his house. I told him no and went inside, where I pretended to study in the library until he left. He waited around doing nothing more for an hour. I started really being scared then. Since that day he invited me to his house, he became more aggressive, making fun of me whenever he bumped into each other in the corridor, saying stuff like, still busy or I'm in no hurry. He found my social medias and sent me messages there, each time more explicit. He would comment on my pictures saying I was sexy and that he knew what I was up to, teasing me. I blocked him everywhere but I always felt like he was watching me all the time. He stopped talking to me but would always stare at me in class. One day I was going back home alone after class. I noticed a car was right next to me, driving slowly and when I looked it was him. He talked to me through the window and invited me in, said he would give me a ride home. It was a residential street, not many people around. I said no and continued walking. He kept insisting and saying he knew where I lived he could drop me there. I started walking fast then, stopped interacting with him at all. I just wanted to get to the main road so there would be more people around. He got angry then, said get in in a voice I almost didn't recognize. I looked at him in shock and his facial expression had changed completely. He had a dark look in his eyes, no smile at all. He looked like he wanted to hurt me. So I ran and got into the first shop I saw, a mini market. I waited until his car left and then sped home. After that I didn't want to go back to class. I asked my mom to change classes. I never told her why, for some reason I felt ashamed, like I somehow caused the situation. 
I finished the semester without incidents and thought it was all over, but after two years, yes, two whole years, he came back. By then I was starting university, and any thoughts of him were out of my mind. Until he created a new account on Facebook and started messaging me again, like nothing happened, like no time had gone by. He said he was hurt I cut him out of my life, that he wanted to be my friend. I blocked every account he made without ever answering. One day to my panic he showed up in my campus. I went to a university that was close from home but still, it couldn't have been a coincidence. He was just across the street, watching me. I hurried and got into a bus before he could talk to me. The next week I wasn't so lucky. I was eating a snack at the cafeteria with a group of friends and he just suddenly came by and introduced himself to everyone, like we were old friends. I could barely breathe. My friends noticed I wasn't feeling well and he seemed to enjoy their confusion and my fear. I pulled him aside and asked him what he was doing, asked him to leave me alone. He said he wouldn't and again had that dark look he had in the car, years before. The creepiest part was just how different it was from the expression he had around everyone else. He looked like a different person. I told him I would tell everyone, and he said he knew I wanted him. He knew I was just a dirty little tease, but that he would get me. My body and mind just shut down when I heard that and I ran back to my friends and started crying. When I finished telling them everything, he had gone away and I never saw him again. When I was 16, what feels like eons ago, I started going to high school that had a public library in it. Upon entering the front doors of the school, there was a wide hallway with the entrance to the library being a straight walk from the school entrance, so it wasn't like outsiders had to walk through the halls to get to it, but it really bothered me that anyone with a library card could be in our school at any given moment that it was open, even if they were only supposed to check out books or use a computer. Having said that, I rarely saw adults that weren't school employees in the library during school hours. My family didn't always have the electricity on, much less the internet, so I would often stay after school to do my homework in the library where I could use the computers. The librarian's desk was in the middle of the library and there were maybe two dozen computers off to one side, in four or five rows. Other than that, there were a few small rooms where the book club would meet or someone could study privately, which were locked up when not in use. One afternoon I had a research essay to do, I think it was about Homer's Odyssey, so I had asked my dad to pick me up two hours after school ended. I went to the library immediately after my last class and chose a computer close to the librarian's desk. Blissfully, only the librarian and I were in the room. I was really pleased to be able to work quietly, and started plugging in away at my assignment. Thirty minutes into writing, I heard the doors of the library open. I didn't look up, but I could hear a man speaking boisterously to the librarian, with her responding in a very chummy way. They were talking like they knew each other very well. After a few minutes of chatting, the librarian excused herself. I can't remember if I heard her say why, but she bustled out of the room and did not return before I left, more than an hour later, which hadn't happened before. I can't say for sure, but I'm almost positive that she was supposed to not leave the library unattended while it was open. They actually closed it when she took lunch sometimes because I'd seen the back in X minutes sign on the door previously. Almost as soon as the librarian left, this adult man decided to use a computer. Being that we were the only two people using computers, you would think he sat nowhere near me, right? He sat one chair away from my right. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was a very large man in every sense of the word, but otherwise, he looked like your average guy with generic black frame glasses. After the first peripheral glance, I tried to avoid looking over at this guy. I also told myself that the librarian knew him, so he's probably okay. Just subdue checking his email. Nothing to be paranoid about. As I'm continuing to research for my essay and make notes, I start hearing this guy giggle in between clicking the mouse. At first quietly, but he starts chuckling within a minute. I didn't want to, but I felt my whole head turn to look at this guy's computer. His monitor was showing what appeared to be a photo covered by colorful jigsaw puzzle pieces. As the guy clicked on the puzzle piece outlines, they disappeared, revealing the picture underneath. When I first looked at it, the picture was completely visible except for two pieces. The image was a naked man posing with his arms over his head. The creep looked over at me, still chuckling. I had the feeling he was canvassing for my reaction, which was unmasked disgust. I logged off and moved to a different computer, which I thought sent the message that he made me uncomfortable. I logged into my new computer and as soon as I started typing, the guy got up, walked over, and sat down next to me. I promptly stood up, kicking over my chair, unplugged the computer, I wanted to log out really fast, and ran out. My dad wasn't going to be there for another 30 minutes, at least. So I waited in the bathroom. Whenever it was about time for me to get picked up, I walked toward the front doors to leave the school, and I decided to peek in the library. The creep was sitting at the computer still, but his body was turned to face the doors and he was looking straight at me, with a big grin on his face. I dropped out of school that year, and this honestly played a part in that decision. 
I felt so vulnerable, and looking back I think that librarian might have been secretly creeped out by this guy and was playing nice in front of him. She might have made a lame excuse to leave the room so that she didn't have to entertain him, which I would understand if she wasn't leaving him alone with an underage student. I didn't trust the school to take it seriously, especially the librarian, so I didn't tell anyone. I just hope that guy isn't prowling around the high school still. Last year I, a 20 year old female, had taken the morning off from work so I could pick up my friend from a pretty serious medical procedure. It had been a tense time and I really just wanted her to get through it okay so she could begin to heal and feel better. I live in New York and her apartment was right off of 42nd Street by Grand Central Station, which is arguably one of the most well populated, busy areas of the city. I had just gotten off the subway and was walking east past Grand Central Station when I made eye contact with this dude walking towards me, and half a block away. He was a thin, looking guy with really creepy eyes, and he was looking basically directly into my soul. It was incredibly unsettling. We were far enough away that I tried to play it off, looked down, and casually strafed to the right a bit so that our paths wouldn't cross. When I looked up, I noticed he mirrored my movement so our paths were directly aligned again. I strafed again to the left, and he again moved to be in line with me, eyes still locked on me. I felt a sick feeling in my stomach and started to freak out a little. He was getting much closer now and we were basically trapped in a group of people so I didn't really have space or time to cross the street. I also didn't want to turn around and go the opposite way because then my back would be towards him. I took my headphones out and kind of slowed down, but he was absolutely still coming for me. When he inevitably got close enough to me that we were within arm's reach of each other, I guess my fight or flight took over and I grabbed him by the shoulders and shoved him aside, sidestepping him. He was full on attempting to collide with me. The group of people around us barely reacted, which is crazy to me. I thought I dodged a bullet, except after shoving him out the way, he began screaming at me. I yelled back at him, what were you doing? Get out of here, you're creepy, keep moving and other random phrases that just fell right in the moment. Deep down I think I was just hoping if I made a scene someone would step in to help, but nobody did, and then I noticed that he had stopped walking and had fully turned his body around to face me again, and then began to walk toward me again. He was yelling at me this time, calling me disgusting, crude names, telling me he was going to smack me and teach me a lesson, etc. I absolutely panicked and began jogging away, only to look back and realizing that he was now jogging after me, still threatening me and screaming at me. He was getting closer and all I could think was find a cop. You're at Grand Central. Where are the cops? Now one stranger noticed or intervened. He was literally 10 feet away from me when I finally just ran up to the biggest burliest dude I could find and yelled help at him. He was a little surprised and didn't do much, but this younger couple next to us stepped in. The guy got in between us and started telling the creepy dude to get lost, that he's making a scene and that he needs to go, etc. While the girlfriend consoled me. The guy glared at me one last time until he finally turned and started walking away, still cursing. I thanked the couple and continued along my way, making it about 5 paces before absolutely breaking down in tears and calling a friend. Thank god for the coffee place nearby that let me loiter while I collected myself before going in to pick up my friend. I thank the universe for that brave couple that stepped in to protect me. To this day I wonder what the man would have done to me if I hadn't shoved him aside or if that couple hadn't stopped him from chasing me. Just goes to show, no matter how many people are around you, if you're having a bad feeling, listen to it. And don't be afraid to yell for help. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.